can go ahead, Under Secretary General. Thank you, Federico. Um, Excellencies, distinguished participants, dear friends, it is really a pleasure for me to welcome you to this meeting in preparation for the fifth UN conference on least developed countries, which I think you know will happen during the last week of January, in fact, from the 23rd to the 27th of January next year in Doha, Qatar. And I'm especially grateful to the government of France for partnering with FERDI, the OECD Development Center and the United Nations to organize this opportunity for us to have a, a frank discussion. The topic of this meeting refers to the need for differential treatment for LDCs. As you all know, in Doha, a new POA, a new program of action for the LDCs will be agreed to take this differential treatment a step forward. The new POA will ensure that the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development works in and for the least developed countries. But for that to happen, the vulnerabilities of LDCs need to be addressed head on. Today's debate will also consider the rationale for the differential treatment that is accorded to LDCs. You know, unfortunately, that rationale has not shifted over the 50 years of the category in the way that we would hope. All of us at my office, myself included, are desperate to do ourselves out of a job. We certainly don't want our children and grandchildren to be reflecting on these same questions and set of challenges 50 years from now. As reports from UNCTAD and my own office make clear, for too many LDCs, important development gaps have actually widened in recent years. And I'm not just talking about because of COVID, this predates the arrival of COVID-19. Sadly, there still exists a compelling rationale for differential treatment to be accorded to the LDCs. As we provide differential treatment, however, our focus should be on the impact of our interventions. As Einstein said, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results is a true sign of insanity. So for the LDCs, Doha must be different. And that's why I talk about LDC 5, not as a moment, not as a moment in time, but the start of a movement, a movement for genuine and lasting change. We need to deliver more than just enhanced market access. We also need to deliver more aid for trade to produce goods with greater value addition that comply with world standards. Jack Stone, the researcher who was in many ways the father of the LDC category, grew up in the Great Depression in the 1920s. The economics of that period shaped his and the international community's response to development for many years. And yet today, we are in the grips of the fourth industrial revolution. Are we really confident that the international community's support for LDCs is keeping pace with technological developments? Everything from farming methods, digital connectivity and vaccine production will require more technological support in the coming years. People in LDCs are affected by climate change in every aspect of their lives. And you know this, droughts reduce agricultural yields. Floods sweep away houses and roads. Hydro dams have water levels that are too low to produce electricity. In fact, and this is a, some figures that I often cite, 488 million people that live in LDCs have no access to electricity in this day and age, which I think is absolutely scandalous. Thus, building resilience is one of the main themes of the new Doha program of action, neg negotiations on which we hope will be concluded in the next couple of weeks. In, my, in October, my office organized the first ever LDC Future Forum in Helsinki, to which Ferdi and the OECD Development Center contributed. This conference promoted a fruitful dialogue between researchers and policymakers, 
on how to make progress on the ground in LDCs. And we are happy to continue that dialogue. In our fireside chat, sort of little conversation that Joe Stiglitz had with me on this stage with respect to debt restructuring, I recall that he said it is too little, too late, leading to too much suffering and no sustainable solution. Unfortunately, this applies to other aspects of access to financing for LDCs. ODA was already declining in real terms over the past decade. In 2019, only five DAC donor countries met the target of committing at least 0.15 to 0.2% of their GNI as ODA to the LDCs. This needs to change to meet the growing financing needs of LDCs to address all the issues that they face today. Most immediately, LDCs need urgent action to vaccinate their populations. The average proportion of persons with at least one dose is still at around 5%. And yet, instead of heeding the UN's call to vaccinate the 1.1 billion people that live in the LDCs, the world's most vulnerable nations, these countries, are being met with punishing restrictions and travel bans. I think this is the greatest test for the international community that is before us today. If we fail on this, future generations will rightly judge us and judge us harshly. Only with solidarity and political will can we achieve a lasting impact through implementing this new blueprint on the ground. And that work starts in Doha. The world needs your ideas and expertise like never before. To create a lasting impact for families, on the farms and in the factories of the world's most vulnerable countries. We want world leaders to commit to bold action in support of these countries. I can also assure you that we are working hard with the World Health Organization and the government of Qatar to make the LDC5 conference a safe space. Our joint goal is for a better future for everyone in the LDCs. And I think we can get there. So thank you all, and I look forward to seeing you at Doha. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Under Secretary General. I will improvise myself as Master of Ceremony and uh, would like to give the floor to Monsieur Philippe Lacoste, uh, du Ministère des Affaires étrangères et des Affaires européennes de France. Monsieur Lacoste. Philippe Lacoste from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and European Affairs in France. Yeah. The floor is yours. Well, thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me loud and clear. Ladies and gentlemen, dear, dear ministers, ladies and gentlemen, representatives of international organizations, high representative of the United Nations for LDCs, Madam, the director of the Development Center of the OECD, the uh, CEO of FERDI, dear Patrick, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy to be able to take the floor in the opening uh, for the opening of this session uh, regarding the 50 years of least developed uh, countries category. Today, more than ever, as the representative, the high representative of the United Nations mentioned that this discussion uh, uh, comes at the right time. And I must say that I am part of the generation who has uh, grown with this uh, belief in uh, the new economic order, international economic order, and the results we have noted are the least I could say, um, mitigated. And this exercise and the conference which will be held in Doha seem to be very uh, relevant. Well, of course, the impact of the crisis was not as dramatic in the uh, uh, LDCs as we might have feared, but the most vulnerable people, uh, young people and women, are those who were more impacted. I think it is particularly important to, to reaffirm the relevance of the LDC category, even though this will be part of our the, today's discussions, the criteria uh, 
regarding this category need to be reviewed uh, and the validity of the support, specific support measures which these countries benefit from at the international level also need to be reviewed. Many, and the high representative has just mentioned that many people believe, and France is one of them, but we believe that the support of the international community for LDCs is a priority. ODA, the to, which uh, with the total amount is quite limited compared to the funds sent by the diaspora or direct investments, have a leverage effect. And it's uh, always uh, when we're somehow worried to look at uh, the reduction of this uh, ODA, which went from 30% in 2010 to 20% in 2019. So development, the development uh, issues for these LDCs deserves some specific attention. The structural factors which uh, partly explain their uh, underdevelopment are still there. And this particularly at a time when the impact of uh, uh, the weather change and warming uh, become more and more important. And we all believe, and I think we all agree in saying that our capacity to um, just achieve the 2030 agenda will first have to be done in these countries. This is not only a moral commitment in line with the promise we made in 2015, i.e. that nobody would be left aside, and we constantly need to remind that through positive externalities related to their development, which have an impact on all global goods, be it in the field of uh, the climate or the health. Ladies and gentlemen, France has reaffirmed the priority of the for LDCs in its development policy. Some of you uh, know that after a long discussion, we have a, uh, in the beginning of August and developed a programming law dedicated to the development, so solidarity and development and fight against the inequalities at the uh, global level. And we had many discussions in the parliament and that the we want to target our actions on the least developed countries, and this is something we that was mentioned again, and this confirms the commitment made by our president to increase the resources available for these countries, and this is part of the law uh, legislation, rather, on 8.7% uh, of our GDP, and it reminds us that this is a priority in our actions for the least developed countries, particularly in Africa, but and not only in Africa. Uh, support to LDCs is a historical marker of our external actions in France, and it is uh, useful sometimes to remind uh, people of the major role Ferdi has played in this field. And for us, this is what explains that we both wanted to support uh, the, today's uh, event and uh, the, the, the fact that we will participate with all possible means to uh, ensure a successful meeting in Doha. The dynamics and the progression towards uh, SDGs is not very uh, uh, quick in these LDCs. Many uh, are, part, are in a new category, emergence category. Uh, without uh, just reminding you the different steps of growth. So with, uh, based on Mr. Rostov's uh, principles, uh, which I learned when I was at university, the, these, this is part of the thematics which will be dealt with today. And um, uh, we have to think about the positive discrimination and see whether all the actions uh, that have been carried out have been fruitful or not. We have to think about uh, the, the, uh, the, the resources and it's very difficult to separate international policy from uh, what is a global trend, but we have uh, to do that. This is a collective exercise we need to carry out so that the international solidarity be able to uh, translate into facts. 
For all these reasons, ladies and gentlemen, I am very happy to see so many uh, skilled people uh, with us today. And I think that their experience and their knowledge will allow us uh, to fuel this collective discussion in preparation for the Doha conference and the implementation of a new action plan. And I will participate and will try to listen to all the discussions today and I wish you, nevertheless, a very fruitful uh, meeting, for, which will be a first step for us. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you to our Director General. And I'm sure Patrick will remind you also that Patrick, but that Paris and France was the country which welcomed and hosted the first and the second conference on LDC. And in 1990, with the Paris Declaration, came the adoption of an action pro program of action for the 90s. And we also know that France tried to integrate uh, the different vulnerability dimensions, particularly to climate warming. And it's uh, uh, partnership for development policy and these are discussions we have had uh, during the last years with the different events uh, which uh, the uh, under secretary general has reminded us with uh, ferdi and the united nations to see how these vulnerability criteria can help us uh, uh, support uh, the ldc's who will be intervening um, on these important issues of how we can rethink and how the criteria of vulnerability uh, should and could continue to, to help us guide international action. Raga, the floor is yours. Thank you, Federico. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Courtney Rattre, Mr. Philip Lacoste, Mr. Patrick Guillemot, dear ambassadors, dear friends, it is a great honor for me to be a part and to open this important event to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the least developed countries category. Today's event, as, as has been uh, told here today, is a part of a series leading to the, the conference in Doha in January, the fifth United Nations conference on LDCs, that we have been, this event is a part of this series that we have been organizing in, in leading to that in coordination with Perdi and the United Nations Office of the High Representative for the Least Developed Countries landlocked developing countries and small island development states and our partners in the LDC4 monitor consortium. We need to support LDCs in their different development tra trajectories and as the development center has already called for in, in the past, we need to rethink how we support LDCs in the changing global landscape. 50 years after the creation in 1971 of the LDC category, the number of LDCs has doubled from 25 to 52 in 1991. Only six countries have been able to graduate from this category. The majority of the remaining 46 LDCs are in Africa. The next UN conference on LDCs in Doha and the implementation of its program of action are a crucial opportunity to rethink how we support LDCs and prioritize support prioritize support to the development of their productive capacities. LTCs will require more support as the pandemic continues to exacerbate vulnerabilities and inequalities. This means increasing financial flows and domestic resource mobilization, improving access to technology and updating national strategies in support of economic diversification and stronger lo local production capabilities excuse me, local production, excuse me again, local production capacities was what I meant to say. Doha will also be a new opportunity to commit to a fairer and inclusive international cooperation system, one that prioritizes LDCs. Yet, this will only be possible if we also commit to closely monitoring and assessing the progress of the LDCs. Going forward, we need to pay special attention to how each LDC's national productive capacities interlink with other key priorities, such as poverty eradiction, leveraging the power of science, technology, and innovation, strengthening international trade, 
facing climate change and building resilience. We also need to look at how to build better monitoring mechanisms of the DOA plan of action. Ladies and gentlemen, the Development Center is actively engaged in supporting LDCs in their sustainable graduation strategies. Just an as an example, only two weeks ago, we launched the Production Transformation Policy Reviews, PTPRs of Bangladesh, thanks to the valuable support of the European Union, implemented at the request of the Ministry of Commerce in, in Bangladesh, in co collaboration with the UN, CDP, EIF, WTO, UNITO and UNCTAD. And just last week, I furthermore had the pleasure of meeting with Her Ex His Excellency Ambassador Tala and the Bangladesh delegation led by the State Secretary visiting Paris. We discussed the importance of productive capacities to strengthen LDCs as they prepare for graduation. And finally, on Monday, we had our high level meeting of the OECD Development Center where the need for platforms to identify shared development solutions and mobilize multilateral support for developing countries and LDCs was reiterated. Dear colleagues, dear friends, as we gather here today on the 50th anniversary of the creation of the LDC category, I know that we share the hope and will to achieve stronger commitments to supporting LDCs graduation sustainably. Six graduated LDCs in 50 years is not enough. The Development Center, together with its long-standing partners, is highly committed to supporting the remaining 46 exit the cate this category for good. I look forward to the discussions here today and thank you again for, for participating in this in important event. Thank you. Thank you, Raga. Thank you for reminding uh, how we can all, um, we should also focus on concrete example of support and uh, this is an excellent transition to my friend uh, uh, Patrick Guillamont, with whom we have been animating for the last decade uh, a monitor on the implementation of the Istanbul Program of Action. And uh, we look forward to um, turn this LDC4 monitor into what I hope will be the LDC5 monitor that will support the international community and LDCs in uh, monitoring concrete actions uh, to support the LDCs in achieving their sustainable development goals. Patrick, um, tu es peut-être le, le plus grand expert uh, sur les questions de vulnérabilité. Patrick, you might be the greatest expert on vulnerability and LDCs, and so it's my pleasure to invite you to take the floor. Merci beaucoup, Federico. Merci. Uh... Thank you, Federico. Thanks uh, all of you for being here. I'd like you to. I would like to thank. The High Representative of the UN for LDCs. Very happy that we've been able to co organize this seminar with you, and I'd like to thank you very much for that. I would also like to thank. The Secretaries General and Directors General of large international institutions, and I can't name all of them. I'd like to say, in particular, to Patricia, Secretary General of the Commonwealth, that you know, I'd like to thank her for being here, and I know how important the cause of the LDCs is to you. Of course, I'd like to thank the ambassadors, the ambassador in charge of the LDCs, the UN, the Piers Nguyen, I just seen you on the screen, and the other ambassadors who have honored us with their presence today. Last word. I'd like to thank Philippe Lacoste. Dear Philippe, thank you for representing the French government. And reminding us that for 50 years, France has been interested in LDCs and promoting the members of that group. This conference was necessary and I think it's original. 
it was necessary because on the eve of Doha, I think it was important to take a pause and step back from this important event, which comes half a century after the creation of the category. And to hear the point of view on that category of the high representatives of large global institutions, as well as of great academics and experts. It's one way that we can approach Doha from a sound footing. And my predecessors who just spoke, have said how important that Doha conference would be. Our conference today is also original because although there have been many useful studies on the evolution and developments within LDCs, as well as criticisms of the category itself, criticism that has become less strong, perhaps, compared with 20 years ago. There's little bit that's sought to show or even discuss the logical uh, foundation of this category and why it's still valid and what its impact has been. There was, in fact, the theme of the works, the books that we published a few years ago at Fadi, including Out of the Trap, which may have been a little optimistic, but it was a reality. And I think it's an occasion, an opportunity for us to talk about some of those findings. By highlighting the logic behind this category and see how it should be changed in order to make it even more robust in the eyes of the public opinion and policy makers that uh, at Doha it um, benefits from complete support. In other words, we need to make into to make Doha into a strong signal after 50 years that this time the countries that are part of their category will soon be able to come out of the trap um, in which they have found themselves. More generally speaking, the experience of half a century of differential treatment on the basis of a category is an interesting and important experience for the future of the international agenda. Everybody dreams of a new international agenda and we don't know what the role of this differentiated treatment, this positive discrimination or affirmative action that Philippe Lacoste mentioned a minute ago will be. There's much discussion on whether differentiated treatment will, should happen on the basis of a category or on the basis of criteria, and there have been many discussions of that. I even remember discussions with the General Directorate for Development in, in Brussels, that's how it used to be called. Uh, and it's really an important point, and I need that we need to draw the general lessons from that e experience of the LDC's category. I think now it's time to go into the crux of the matter and in order to give you a little bit of method I would like to remind you that we'll have three segments. The first segment will be an analysis of the logic behind the category and whether and in, to what degree it remains valid today and we'll be talking about structural um, vulnerabilities in particular. The second segment, uh, we'll look at research and the impact of belonging to the category by looking at results in terms of economic growth, um, ODA, international trade, integration into global the global economy, and again, vulnerability, I'm sure, will appear as a central issue. And then the third panel, will ask whether these structural handicaps that characterize the category may or may not have been reduced to over the past 50 years and whether policies directed at this category have done enough to reduce those handicaps and in, in particular in order to reduce structural vulnerabilities. 
whose magnitude has appeared more and more blatantly over the recent years. So that's the general organization of our conference. And we can now move on to the first part of the conference itself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. And recalling that this is part of a process that we started already in 2020 and that will not end in Doha. Uh, we aim at creating a momentum for Doha and we have invited all our member countries to make their best efforts to be represented at the highest possible level in Doha. And uh, as Development Center together with Ferdi, uh, the United Nations and others, we will also be organizing uh, an important side event um, to launch this LDC5 monitor. So we wish the colleagues in New York uh, all the best for this last mile. But again, it's not the, the end of the story, it's the beginning of a journey uh, that we will be very happy to uh, support and accompany going forward. With this, I declare close the opening session and I turn to Patrick uh, for the moderation of the first uh, session. Thank you very much. Patrick, s'il te plaît. Merci, Federico. Donc, uh, il me revient de... Thank you, Federico. So it is my task to moderate this first session on the topic of the rationale of the LTC category and its criteria, is it still valid? And so I'll say a few words on how I'm able to differentiate between developing countries and on what basis. And in order to do that, I'll do a little introductory presentation um, with a few slides that will be in English. I will be speaking French, but the, the slides will be in English. But let me introduce the panelists who will be helping me in this exercise, José Antonio Campo, to start with. Famously a great development economist with a prestigious past because he used to be a minister, he's still a professor at Columbia University, but uh, even more relevantly, he's here as the president of the Committee for Development Policy. the United Nations, a committee that I've been a member of many years. Then we'll hear from Perks Ligoya, whom I acknowledged earlier on, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Malawi to the UN and Chair of the LDC Group. As we speak, we don't know yet whether the Secretary General of the Francophonie will be with us, but if she is, we'll be very happy to welcome her. Then we'll hear from a right on oh, Patricia Scotland, Secretary General of the Com Commonwealth Secretariat, whom I acknowledged earlier on. Our friend Kunduns will also be with us. He's the Director General, Director General for International Partnerships and PA at the European Union. Uh, well, at the last moment, we wouldn't be here, but his Assistant Director General has stepped in, which is brilliant. And then we also have the Ambassador and Permanent Delegate to UNESCO of Bangladesh, Mr. Konger Maltaha. But as I promised I would, let me take 10 to 15 minutes to tell you about our view of the category and what's left of it. So perhaps we could show the slides while I'm speaking. If it's not possible, then I'll speak without the slides. I'll mention about it a dozen points. First of all, let's remind ourselves that this category was created in 1971 
by a decision of the United Nations General Assembly. And that it led to the first identification of just 25 LDCs at the time. But it happened after several years of discussions within the United Nations because it was going to be an exception. The group of the 77 was initially supposed to be a block. And this was going to be an exception. It re did remain an exception, the only official and sustainable exception to this ranking of countries in large, in several large groups. And so the category was thus conceived and accepted as an exception in the UN's national international development strategy. The This use of a strategy was preferred to a more progressive approach, such as a country-specific support based on continuous criteria. Continuous criteria are used to define the, the category and can also be used beyond it, independently of it. Um, but the criteria were targeted in order to capture a number of countries that face handicaps, particularly severe handicaps in terms of their growth and development. This category, from the outset, was founded on a concept which was implicit at the beginning but became explicit as time went by. which was really the guiding thread that we had for 50 years. Um, that is, the countries that due to handicaps inherited to, from the past that is out of the current field of governments challenged were exogenous constraints of rapid growth could be said to be caught in a trap and could be said to be out of the convergence path of economic theory and that are amongst poor countries the ones that are the most uh, under the threat of remaining poor for exogenous reasons. Truly the concept of structural handicap was at the core of this category and it was in line with the principle of international justice as conceived by Sen or Rawls uh, and the idea was to equalize opportunities but equalizing opportunities between nations means to attack those structural handicaps that do not depend on the current will of governments and this concept must of course be reflected by the handicap criteria that ended up being used in order to identify those countries and which as we will see are increasingly used or should be incre increasingly used even beyond that category Third point, this category is identified through three criteria, which have been considered as absolute or relative in alternation. For those of you who may not remember that, let me just remind you that one of the criteria is the low level of GDP per capita, and there are two handicap criteria, one relative to the low level of human capital and the other to the weak economic structure. And the design of those criteria did change over time. Initially, both indicators were abs absolute, um, like literally level, for example, but then they became in time relative criteria. And the fact that there are only two criteria to define belonging to the category may look like a technical detail, but these criteria for a long time were absolute criteria established uh, in comparison with the distribution within a group of comparable countries. And then it became relative and there's been a recent attempt to make them absolute and their debate remains should those criteria be absolute or relative. The next point is that these criteria 
and complementary. This also might sound technical, but it has important political consequences on how we manage the category. In order to be included on the list, you need to fulfill three criteria, and so they're complementary. Où on regardait l'économie de façon très complémentaire. Il y a peu de substituabilité. C'était les coefficients fixes euh, dans la planification des années 70. Or, euh, ces deux handicaps, le capital humain et le faible niveau de capital humain et, et la faible structure économique, sont effectivement euh, des facteurs négatifs de croissance. Mais le caractère, leur caractère complémentaire pour euh, affaiblir ou bloquer la croissance fait l'objet d'un débat. Euh, on a fait des travaux. On, empirique là-dessus, économétrique, euh, euh, cette hypothèse est apparue euh, valable peut-être pour la première moitié de l'histoire de, de la catégorie, mais beaucoup moins pour la, pour la fin. Donc, euh, il semble qu'aujourd'hui, l'hypothèse de complémentarité euh, est euh, l'hypothèse de complémentarité euh, affaiblit euh, la rationalité de la catégorie. Nous avons un petit problème de traduction, semble-t-il. Oui, euh, oui, oui. On n'entend plus l'anglais, en fait. Écoutez, alors je vais continuer en français. En is everything working now? This is the interpreter. Here. Is the English fine now? Non, les, 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 deux, les deux canaux sont inversés, français et anglais. Is everything fine now? This is the English interpreter. Is everything fine? Fine. Autrement dit, les anglophones m'écoutaient en français. So everything should be sorted now. Perfect. Okay, so if the French people want to still listen to me in French, do please choose the French channel. If you want to listen to English, please uh, choose the English channel. So as long as everyone is on the right channel, it should be fine. Sorry, to keep going. So I was just going over the introductory paragraph on this slide here. So we're talking about the complementary nature of these, of the different criteria behind the category. And then the empirical analysis came in and impacted the definition of the category and which actually gave rise to the fact that there was a structural handicap behind the negative factors of growth. And that actually had a limited impact on how substitutable, substitutable they could actually be. Moving on to the next slide. So the three complementary criteria actually gave rise to a form of asymmetry between inclusion and graduation rules. And it was only in 1991 that graduation rules were actually introduced. They were done so somewhat cautiously so as to avoid any backtracking or any breaks in developing pro development programs that were underway. So asymmetry was introduced into the criteria just in a minority way, certainly differently to graduation rules. But the main asymmetry rule was introduced because for it to be graduated, countries had to fulfill two of the three criteria. But is, that's just a very technical matter here. But that actually major influence on the way the category evolved over time. And it actually slowed down the rhythm of graduation. And if we have a look at the chart on the following slides, there we have the slide here. The number of LDCs that continue to fulfill the inclusion criteria, the line in red, had slow change roughly 14 of 46 countries. So that's quite a small number, especially compared to the number of countries that actually, overall countries that started to decline, which was the blue line at the top. 
between the two, you have the number of countries that did not meet graduation criteria. And there's a, there's a large gap between the two numbers there. So they're not eligible for inclusion and they're not yet eligible for graduation. So I think it's important to understand that uh, because sometimes it's hard to understand that when looking from the outside. So this asymmetry could be corrected and it can be corrected in a way so as to avoid structural handicaps. And this is important for LDC countries that are no longer considered poor and are no longer suffering from some of the most severe handicaps that had been seen in for other countries, especially when looking at long-term development handicaps that had been determined in the past and that were that are outlined as part of the SDGs. So in terms of structural vulnerability, the current rationale of LDCs is as it stands here, because back in 2000, it was a vulnerability indicator that actually replaced a large number of diversification criteria that were applied until then. And that had a major impact on eligibility of a number of countries to attain a graduate, to fulfill graduation rules. And it was a challenge for a lot of these countries, especially for those countries that were just on the cusp of tipping over from one category into the next. So it was determined to be an indicator of structural, economically structural vulnerability. And it was important in coming in determining the indicator at the outset, but today there are other notions of vulnerability that come into play. While others have been left to the wayside. For example, there are exogenous uh, social and cultural shocks such as epidemics, digital divide and the like. But there are also more physical uh, shocks such as the climate, which has been a, a major, uh, major factor to take into account for many LDCs. So there's an the economic environmental index, for example, which has come into play, but there isn't yet a fully multifaceted indicator. So if we move on to the next slide, when we talk about multifaceted, multidimensional vulnerability, slide, uh, next slide, please. Multidimensional vulnerability. Now, in today's terms, seems as a major handicap for sustainable development. So in December of last year, just a year ago, the United Nations General Assembly sent a request to the Secretary General to come up with a multidimensional vulnerability index, the MVI. One that was to be used for the number of small island developing states, but also for all other vulnerable countries so as to mobilize financial support in their favor, to provide them with additional financial support. That index has a number of exogenous structural implements, which is useful for LDC type indexes, but as well as, as other indexes. Remember human capital as determined or as outlined in the index of LDCs, it actually represents the core of structural resilience that multidimensional vulnerability index also seeks to contain. So this ultimately leads to another category of countries that are facing drastic uh, obstacles and hindrances when attaining uh, sustainable development targets, especially as outlined in 2012 documents by the CDP and is consistent with the SDGs that were adopted in 2015. So there was a change in rationale because the category became more in depth, especially in light of recent ideas, recent measures, and also the recent context. Remember the rationale 
of the category has also been strengthened because of its impact and it can be further strengthened and bolstered. Well, membership of the category has helped a number of LDCs to to sidestep a number of measures and to, to step out of po poverty. I think that in itself is an argument to actually justify and back up the true founding of the rationale. If we could move on to the final slide, please. And it's actually quite challenging, and we'll see this a little later. The true impact of the category on member countries can be measured. And the impact is far above what could have been initially hoped for when creating the category, but progressively it was highlighted and evidenced. So the impact was actually quite under what was expected. But it, what we have seen is that there has been a reversal of the average relative rate of growth within LDCs of the last 20 years. And I think this goes to highlight how important it is to strengthen the rationale, to enhance it, to improve it, to improve the criteria consistently and to have it recognized as universal criteria that go beyond international uh, policy and the like so that it so that support to LDC countries will continue in the future and and then after Doha we will be able to ensure that the rationale is determined and approved in a way so that it is in line with SDGs. So thank you very much for just giving me that opportunity to share with you a quick insight about the LDC category and the rationale behind it. And I think it would be very interesting to hear the points of views of our different speakers first and foremost, we will hear from the chairman of the CDP. Jose Antonio, Ocampo, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Patrick. Uh, thank you uh, to all the uh, organizations to, uh, for the invitation to be uh, with you today. Uh, let me, uh, of course, talk, talk uh, in, the, in the name of the Committee for Development Policy to which Patrick uh, belonged uh, in the past, as he uh, pointed out in his presentation, uh, and, uh, and refer to, uh, uh, to the issue of the, uh, this category of uh, LDCs. Uh, let me uh, start by saying that uh, uh, this is, of course, the, uh, the only uh, development category uh, that has been uh, accepted by the United Nations, uh, which is by itself, um, you know, an outstanding uh, feature uh, that must be uh, taken into account. Uh, second, uh, uh, it is based on sound principles. Uh, uh, Patrick already uh, made um, uh, a presentation. Uh, le let me uh, uh, underscore, uh, however, that uh, we, uh, every three years, uh, we uh, discuss uh, uh, the criteria uh, uh, for uh, classifying a country as LDCs, uh, both to entry and to graduate uh, from the LDC category. And, um, uh, and the, in the last one, so, so, so this category that is uh, dynamic, uh, we analyze uh, uh, proposals for new criteria uh, and, uh, uh, and very importantly, um, you know, whether uh, th those criteria can be measured for the disease, which is, of course, an essential issue uh, uh, to, uh, for acceptance of that category. Uh, the, uh, categor the category is multidimensional. Uh, as Patrick uh, mentioned, uh, it, uh, uh, it basically has uh, three criteria, a uh, gross natural income per capita, uh, a human asset index uh, that includes uh, indicators of education and health, let me say, uh, in the last round, we, we basically included some gender equality issues in both indicators uh, to, uh, to strengthen the, uh, the category. Uh, and then we have the uh, Economic and Environmental Vulnerability Index, uh, uh, which, uh, by the way, uh, if, if, you know, I think they, they could be divided in two. 
uh, because the, the, the two uh, issues are entirely different. I'll refer actually to the environmental vulnerability uh, 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 you know, later in my, in my presentation. Uh, let me say that the, uh, 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 I'm not totally sure that uh, uh, consolidating this into just one structural uh, vulnerability index uh, 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 will make uh, 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 lots of sense. But of course, I uh, will uh, consider and invite Patrick to uh, to the next discussion to uh, of the uh, of the criteria uh, which uh, will have a, a, a this year a next year actually. So, uh, if anything, I mean there are two elements uh, that uh, uh, I will uh, per perhaps underscore uh, uh, of the you know the consistency of the criteria uh, that we see in practice. Uh, the first is the case uh, of a, a country that graduate on the GNI per capita criteria alone, which is when they have two, more than twice the minimum level. Uh, and some of those countries were, uh, are associated to uh, the discovery of oil in particular, uh, and, uh, and they don't meet the other criteria. They continue to have low human assets uh, and uh, uh, high uh, economic uh, vulnerability because of the high concentration of exports in one commodity. Uh, therefore, there are uh, uh, some countries that meet the, uh, the uh, or that are graduated from the LDC, but they continue to have uh, structural vulnerabilities to uh, use that term. And the second uh, is the case of some uh, of the uh, small islands in, in the, in the uh, uh, in, uh, let's say, in the Pacific, uh, uh, which uh, 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 have actually asked uh, not to be graduated, uh, basically because of the uh, one of the elements of the vulnerability uh, in, a, in uh, economic terms, which is distance. Uh, uh, so the, um, uh, they meet the criteria, the other two criteria, a GNI per capita and uh, human asset, but they have uh, this uh, sp special vulnerability that they consider to be very important. Anyway, uh, we continue discussing this issue every three years and uh, uh, I will invite Patrick for uh, his analysis. Let me say uh, in terms of the use of the category uh, that uh, uh, unfortunately the criteria for, uh, for the allocation of ODA uh, uh, has not been met, uh, as the high representative already pointed out. Uh, 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 but uh, at least uh, uh, two, uh, uh, I mean, the, the trade criteria uh, uh, or the use, excuse me, of the, of the LDC criteria in uh, trade preferences uh, has been successful uh, and has been agreed. Uh, and I think this is a very important point. Uh, although at the same time, it means like when countries graduate, uh, they lose uh, trade preferences. And, and this is a major issue that we're discussing with some of the graduating countries, for example, with Bangladesh, uh, which has extensively used uh, uh, the, uh, the trade criteria. Um, and, uh, let me say also that uh, uh, we find it uh, uh, disappointing, actually, that the World Bank and the IMF have not accepted uh, the LDC criteria, uh, which I think is much better than the criteria that they use themselves uh, for low-income countries. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, the, um, uh, the third point uh, that uh, I want to uh, point, uh, point out uh, is, the, is the issue that uh, we have been discussing quite a bit how to support and monitor uh, countries, uh, uh, both countries that um, uh, you know, are in the process of graduating, uh, but also those that are gra have graduated. Uh, so we have given uh, more time in the transition in the last round uh, uh, of proposals to, uh, for graduation uh, because of the COVID-19 crisis. So we, we asked for a five-year transition rather than three years, uh, uh, and that has been accepted, and, and that's the uh, rule that is being uh, used now. Uh, in some cases, for example, the case of Bhutan, we uh, had accepted in the past a uh, five-year criteria uh, also, because they wanted to, uh, the graduation to be associated to the uh, five-year development plan. Uh, anyway, so that's a, a, something that we have done and, and, and the enhanced monitoring mechanism uh, that we have put in place uh, means that we have almost a persistent, constant uh, evaluation of the uh, uh, of LDCs, uh, both the existing LDCs, uh, the graduating LDCs and the graduating LDCs. 
And, and finally, uh, let me uh, refer to the uh, comments on, on the issue of climate change. Uh, and, and let me point out in that regard that the, some of the uh, 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 elements that we have in the environmental uh, 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 criteria do reflect uh, some of the issues associated to climate change. For example, the, uh, the share of population in low elevated coastal zones. That's one, uh, which is a major risk for several islands. Uh, and uh, it's a share of population uh, living in dry lands uh, and, uh, and the victims of disasters. So those are three of the four criteria for environmental uh, vulnerability. Uh, we can discuss how to improve that. In any case, uh, one point that uh, we had made uh, in uh, a few years ago to the uh, to ECOSOC uh, it, it was the uh, the fact that uh, it, associated to these uh, small islands, uh, that some of them graduate according to the uh, economic criteria and the human assets, uh, but their environmental vulnerability is extremely high. Uh, and therefore, uh, we have proposed that the UN creates an environmental vulnerability index on, on its own uh, to uh, classify countries that are environmentally vulnerable, uh, for example, uh, to receive a special uh, amounts of ODA for environmental reasons. Uh, but the, the, when they do not meet the other criteria for LDCs, uh, that is the uh, human uh, assets and the uh, per capita income, uh, they should uh, graduate uh, from medicine. But this category, so this has to do with the inconsistency that we have found, uh, particularly for the uh, Pacific Islands, in some cases uh, between the, uh, uh, they say the structural vulnerability associated to, uh, to, the, uh, to the environment, uh, but uh, at the same time, the fact that they meet the criteria uh, for graduation as LDCs. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation, and, and this uh, I conclude my, my remarks. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, José Antonio. Um, maybe we can hear now the uh, Ambassador Pex Ligoya, uh, who is uh, the chair of the LDC group at ECOSOC. Uh, merci beaucoup, mon professeur uh, Patrick. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me loud and clear? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you very much. Uh, being invited by my good friend and Professor Patrick, uh, OHRLs, uh, the French government, and OECD to speak in this event. Uh, Patrick's stewardship, friendship, wisdom, and personal warmth, along with the continued advice and support for OHRLs, have made my work as the chair of LDC Global Bureau both more productive and more pleasurable. Thank you again for all your contributions to advancing the sustainable development of LDCs and for the opportunity of being at your side once more. I am uh, extremely delighted to have uh, uh, a distinguished uh, panel, uh, Professor Ocampo, uh, uh, including uh, the Right Honorable Patricia Scotland, who I, I had the pleasure uh, of meeting uh, during the COP26. Excellencies, uh, you'll agree with me that the LDC group was established 50 years ago in an attempt to deliver differentiated treatment to countries that face the most binding constraints to growth and development. This differentiated treatment takes the form of what is known as the international support measures and covers development finance, technology and technical assistance packages for LDCs among others. This has been uh, very well elaborated uh, by the previous speakers. What I will try to do here is to speak from the vantage point of LDCs. The two critical points of which I wish to focus are first, uh, the erosion of this differentiated treatment over the years. And second, why having the group continues to be relevant and how to turn around the gradual erosion of the marginal payoff accruing to LDCs. 
Uh, Excellence, mesdames et messieurs. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Many will agree with me that the rules regarding the financing of development, or trade, and technologies have been leveled for all the developing countries and not only for develop for LDCs. Actually, the range of uh, development finance thing which uh, LDCs have access to uh, evolve, has evolved, particularly during the last uh, 20 years. The size, the relative size of ODA and the flow of external resources has gone down, while the private flows such as foreign direct investments, the funds are sent by the diaspora and have increased everywhere, including in LDCs. A growing number of such countries find their resources on the capital markets. And despite the fact that, that the, the trade and negotiations in Doha were in a deadlock, which started in 2011, the restrictions on the movement of goods and services for all countries, whatever the level of income per capita, are less numerous and less constraining than they were in the 90s and the year 2000. Therefore, the marginal, uh, the preferential trade for LDCs compared to other developing countries has gone down. At the same time, the uh, uh, advent of the fourth industrial revolution opened the opportunities that were both quantitative and qualitative for LDCs and other developing countries, provided that they are able to uh, fully leverage the potential of this revolution. In a context where their preferences, their trade preferences go down, you have to try and think about what being an LDC means in uh, 2021. What continues to differentiate this category of uh, countries from the others is the unique way in which it is defined. We have heard Professor Ocampo say that every three years this definition is reviewed and next year, we will actually review this definition, this LDC definition. It all started with the Development Policy Committee, a group of independent experts carrying out a technical examination and uh, for the inclusion and the graduation from this LDC categories. Recommendations are then presented to 12 UN bodies, ECOSOC and the General Assembly. And this unique combination of a group of experts and discussions, intergovernmental discussions, is an opportunity to have an open and transparent discussion and gives more liability, which increases in turn the legitimacy of this category. And the LDCs were also present and made their voices heard in major global uh, events. And thus, the agenda for 2030, the action program for Addis Abeba and the Paris Agreement are a reference, they all make reference to LDCs. These countries therefore remain active in the implementation and the monitoring of this, uh, these major global frameworks. In addition to their active presence in World Fora, the LDCs continue to benefit from a, a strong support in the operational activities of most uh, United Nations entities from the trade, World Trade Organization and in the 
uh, the, the strategies of many donor countries. Therefore, we call the IMF and the World Bank to adopt this definition, which to our mind is more appropriate that, uh, the, than the definitions used by the IMF and the World Bank. Reversing the uh, gradual erosion of uh, their benefits requires a major commitment. It also requires to understand the aspirations of the international community and the resources, the existing resources in the new action program, which is in the discussion, which will be adopted during the fifth conference of the United Nations for LDCs. You will agree with me that these special and specific incentives given to LDCs have been very useful, especially uh, the trade incentives, as has been said by the previous speakers. And we encourage uh, the uh, CDP and others uh, to continue with the uh, reviewing the definition because the world today with the fragilities and vulnerabilities uh, that we have now is not the same world that was there in uh, 1971. In fact, the UN Secretary General has proposed in his submission called our common agenda that the classification of countries should uh, uh, maybe move away from uh, 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 basing uh, the definitions on GDP. But we are sure, uh, we, we know that for us, our definitions, we have gone beyond that to look at other factors, which uh, Professor Ocampo uh, has mentioned. And this opens up uh, an interesting area of research uh, for my very professor Gilmore and other researchers. The argument is that a country that is classified as a middle income today can easily be pushed back into the LDC category because of a natural disaster or other factors emanating from uh, climate change. This is the very reason for which we are requesting all our partners to continue providing the LDC specific incentives to graduating and graduated countries for some years after graduation. As we heard from our Professor Ocampo, uh, currently uh, it's at five years. It was at three, but we are thankful that they moved that to five years. This matter is uh, there in our draft Doha program of action. We initially proposed that this term be extended further, but we know that the matter is still under discussion at the WTO. And we hope the WTO will be reasonable uh, to suggest an increase in the period. In Doha, we will continue with this commemoration of 50 years of LDC category. On 22nd January, there will be a summit of the heads of state of government to celebrate 50 years of the LDC group. So this meeting today uh, works as a good preamble for this event in Doha. Recommendations that we can make here will therefore be used as input into this meeting on 22nd January. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, 50 years after the creation of the LDC category, our countries, the LDCs, are still reeling under the pangs of poverty. We know there are more poor people today 
than there were before the pandemic. We know there are more than 820 million people that are suffering from hunger and food insecurity. Inequality within and between countries has increased. The pandemic has also taught us the reality that the material, multilateralism spirit of countries uh, of helping each other is not working as well as we would all want. For example, only uh, between five to 7% of, of the African population has been vaccinated when the global average is 55%. The latest World Inequalities Report 2022 gives a very grim picture that the richest 3,000 people in the world own 5% of global wealth, when the lowest 50% of the population only controls 2% of global wealth. The share of the top 10% of the world population controls 76% of global wealth. This explosion of extreme concentration of the economic power in the hands of a very small minority of the super rich is alarming. The call of LDCs is for a reasonable share of wealth to be uh, distributed uh, to the poor. Can you... Uh, yes, I, I'm finishing, I'm finishing, Prof. I'm finishing, Prof. I'm finishing. Uh, so our draft uh, uh, program of action is almost finalized. The co-chairs of the PREPCOM have just released the second revised edition of the document, and we expect our consultations to be finalized by mid-December. On behalf of the LDC group, I want to uh, finish by thanking the French government, OECD, OHRL, Ferdi, uh, for organizing this important uh, meeting. In conclusion, I look forward to stimulating exchange reviews and hope to see you all in Doha. Thank you very much for giving me this occasion to speak. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Excellency. Um, uh, we move immediately to the right honorable Patricia Scotland. If uh, Patricia is uh, is here. Thank you very much, Patrick. Merci. <laughs> so, Excellencies, dear friends, I want to thank uh, my dear brother, the Under Secretary General Courtney Rattray, for his illuminating summary of where we are. And I want to say straight away that I agree with his analysis and will do all I can to be with you in Doha. But I want to thank all speakers who have spoken before me today and thank each of you for your acuity and trenchant commitment to the most vulnerable amongst us. And I particularly want to thank you, Patrick, for your masterful exposition of the multifaceted nature of vulnerability and the assistance that you and Ferdi have provided to so many of us. As you know, the Commonwealth is a voluntary association of 54 independent and equal countries, home to more than 2.5 billion people across developed and developing countries, 60% of whom, of that 2.5 billion, are under the age of 30. And 13 of the least developed countries are in the Commonwealth. So this is a critical question for us and a priority issue for me as Secretary General. So I want to focus my contribution in this session as to where we, the multilateralists, find ourselves today, right here, right now, in the present. And as others have said, at the very heart of the least developed country classification is vulnerability. When we look at the least developed countries through that lens of vulnerability, we see clearly that the categorization is important and helpful, but limited in the face of today's challenges. Helpful because grouping the least developed countries together has enabled us and them to have an increasingly strong collective voice at the international level. This was plain to see at COP26 where the voices and the views of the least developed countries were present throughout. And helpful because the category has helped 
to keep the plight of the least developed countries and forced us to assess some important truths about the reality of the world in which we live. We understand vulnerability much better, in part because the categorization has compelled us to focus on it closely. And as a result, we understand that the least developed countries categorization is still, regrettably, very relevant today, but is limited in the face of today's challenges because we now understand the full scope and complexity of vulnerability in the present day. It is multidimensional, shaped by the risk of being affected and disrupted by external shocks of various forms, origin and intensity. And that risk is shaped by each country's specific characteristics, features and resilience. So high vulnerability combined with low levels of human capital are self reinforcing structural handicaps to sustainable development and inclusive growth, leading low income countries into a vicious trap from which it is not easy to escape. Previously, most development partners and multilateral institutions did not understand vulnerability in this way. So we can say with confidence that the full scope of vulnerability as we understand it today is larger and deeper than that which is reflected by the existing LDC categorization. We can see this in the experience of Vanuatu, whose graduation from an LDC was delayed after Cyclone Pam wiped out 60% of the economy overnight in 2015. And we can see it most plainly in the impact COVID-19 across our most vulnerable member states. So external shocks can destroy years worth of development gains in an instant. And when I was elected as Secretary General during the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Malta in 2015, my promise to Commonwealth leaders and citizens was that we will work together as a family to bring back the wealth to the Commonwealth. And understanding and tackling vulnerability and poverty is absolutely central to that mission. And this was the starting point for the comprehensive analytical exercise carried out by the Commonwealth Secretariat and culminated in the design of our new flagship universal and multidimensional vulnerability index, the UVI. And I think this can be a game changer in analyzing and addressing vulnerability. So Patrick, all that you are doing is critical. It is universal because it covers three specific vulnerabilities, economic, climatic, and social. It allows us to assess the severity of each of the dimensions and to directly take into account specific aspects of resilience. And it is also universal because it recognizes that vulnerability is not a challenge only for low income countries, but it confirms the complexity, depth, and extent of the innate vulnerabilities suffered by the LDCs. Every country has vulnerabilities and every country has work to do to improve its resilience. And because of our close global interdependence, what happens anywhere can have an impact everywhere. And this has been reinforced by the pandemic and is illustrated by the current status of vaccine distribution, which my brother, performing has just mentioned. And the swift and skillful development of the vaccine is an example of human ingenuity. But the failure to ensure it is distributed evening, even, evenly is a huge moral failure that places great pain and burden on vulnerable countries who are at the mercy of the imbalances in global power. It is also a huge own goal for humanity because nobody is safe until everybody is safe. And perhaps now the penny will drop that vulnerability anywhere is at times vulnerability everywhere. And the Commonwealth UVI shows us that the 25 of the 30 most vulnerable countries are LDCs, most of them located in sub-Saharan Africa. So given that some of these states 
are members of the Commonwealth. This qualifies as an urgent priority for us. And the LDC categorization has really helped us to understand all of this much better. And if it continues to be relevant and useful, it needs to better reflect our deeper understanding of vulnerability, enabling the least developed and most vulnerable countries to access the support they need to rise to the challenges of the world today, especially multi-dimensional crises like climate change. And I will pause um, there, Patrick, um, and my remarks and look forward to uh, a lively discussion if we have any time left. Merci beaucoup, uh, Patricia. Uh, I know that uh, Jose Antonio has Thank you very much, Patricia. I know that uh, Jose Maria Antonio needs to leave us in a few minutes. Jose Antonio, can you? Uh, yes, uh, Patrick, I have to leave in, uh, in uh, about four or five minutes. Thank you for the invitation anyway. Oh, so uh, we, you, uh, you will not have the chance to hear your answer to the, uh, to the talk uh, by uh, the right honorable Patricia Scotland. But uh, may maybe we, we should move on to the next speakers uh, without yeah. hearing your, your, your reaction. Don't, don't worry, I largely agree with her. <laughs> but anyway, the talk will be will uh, will go on. M maybe in door, maybe in door. Okay, very good. Thank you. Th thanks for joining us. Okay, so uh, we we move now to uh, Miriam Ferrand, um, uh, who is uh, representing um, our friend Condens. Uh, um, um, Je suis là, est-ce que vous pouvez m'entendre? Oh, très bien, oui, oui, merci. Je ne savais pas si vous... Yes, I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I didn't know if you were a francophone or not. I'm not just a francophone, I'm French. And in fact, um, I love the fact that I'm able to use my mother tongue today. And I'd like, of course, to apologize on behalf of Kunduns. He really wanted to be with you today, but at the very last minute, he was uh, summoned elsewhere. But I'm absolutely delighted that I stepped in for him for this most interesting panel in order to give you the European Commission's opinion uh, or view on criteria and how they've evolved. Thank you very much for reminding us what their history was, by the way, Patrick. And uh, I can't help but think that our predecessors who were talking in 1971 unconsciously may have hoped that we wouldn't be having this discussion 50 years down the line. And yet, unfortunately, if you look at the statistics, I believe that only six of the LDCs did graduate over that period of 50 years. And if you look horizontally, clearly the nature of the difficulties and the structural and systemic uh, vulnerabilities remains and even complexify, complexifies in a way. And I think I'll be talking about uh, environmental uh, vulnerabilities or climate change. I mean, that has been um, uh, mentioned already. But whatever the case may be, the problems remain the same and we still see the same vulnerability to external shocks. The current pandemic is clearly an example of an external shock that can send all of the progress backward by one decade. So in this context, where are we at 50 years after? And in the context of COVID, and is the definition still relevant? From the EC's point of view, if you we look at the global situation, to us it seems that this criterion has had a major advantage, the advantage of focusing political attention at a global level and of focusing support 
of ODA, but not just development aid, but all of the support tools and all of the support systems for development. And from that perspective, we feel that the criterion um, and the category is still very much relevant. And in fact, the reference uh, is still found in all development uh, policy documents, including the 2030 um, agenda. From a European policy perspective, we're also still making references to that category, with the latest example being the fact that a few weeks, uh, months ago, we adopted our Europe, global, global Europe financial instrument, um, which makes or gives pride of praise to LDCs with criteria and a fund allocation methodology that actually rely on the very same three criteria that are used to categorize LDCs. So we developed our own financial budgets for the next seven years on the basis of these same criteria, which we feel are still valid. The question would rather be whether or no, no, we need to go beyond and how we use the criteria. In terms of how we use the ranking or the classification, we actually really use it in order to identify vulnerable countries or risk countries or countries that warrant a focus from us rather than in terms of our interventions. So we look at the general level, we look at the classification, but beyond that, we actually um, use a case by case approach. And increasingly, the truth is that we base our work on the multidimensional nature of vulnerabilities and challenges affecting countries. And in light of the impact or prevalence of the various types of vulnerability, we then adapt our interventions and our support measures. In order to do that, we use a coordinated approach that goes well beyond development tools. So we talk a lot about the humanitarian development and country nexus because beyond the three vulnerability criteria, we look at the causes of these vulnerabilities and we try to tackle the causes, knowing that the causes of poverty are often the source of conflicts that themselves in turn generate external shocks. So we look at the multi-dimensional set of factors and within the global Europe, uh, financial instrument, we have used that very approach, bringing all of the instruments together and creating a continuum uh, of humanitarian aid in case of uh, acute crisis, supported by development support policies in order to tackle the potential causes of damages um, down the line, and if needed, uh, um, an approach on human conflicts when those conflicts exist. Also globally and increasingly, we work with member states. Budget of community institutions is being used in parallel with member states. And also increasingly with financial European partners, um, AFD, KFW, um, ICID, the European Investment Bank, all of these partners, in order to bring a global response and to go beyond mere ODA and attract private capital on top of ODA in order to meet the structural difficulties that I mentioned and to multiply the impact of our interventions so that increasingly we use pure financial instruments by bringing in partners that didn't necessarily use to be part of the development policy circles, but we feel that working with these uh, banks and with private capital should allow us to improve our impact. Um, something else that we do, as other speakers have said before me, is uh, a trade policy that takes um, into account 
this categorization with different levels of preferences for LDCs. That's something very important. In fact, every time a country graduates as one of the criticism that we get systematically because they feel that the effects of graduation are punishment in a way because they lose out in terms of trade preference. And we also take into account this category of countries when we design our own internal policies, in particular now because we're talking so much about the Green Deal, environmental policies or carbon taxes at the borders of our countries or Europe. We know that the products of countries that are known um, that don't harm the forests, that don't create deforestation. We know that all of these policies have impact on LDCs and it's clear that in designing such policies we do take into consideration the situation of those countries. Uh, so all this to say that our response is to keep using the criteria as they exist, but to bring a differentiated response to each country's circumstances. And now in answer to your question of whether the criteria should be modified and whether we shouldn't use a um, more multidimensional index, um, we have adopted a wait and see attitude. If people tell us the index is going to be complexified, Somebody has left their microphone open and the interpreter can't hear the speaker. Can you ask all speakers to turn off their mics, please? Merci. Donc, je termine. Donc, notre seule crainte, si l'on va vers un. Our only fear is that if we go towards a more complex index and that it happens to be a little too complex to allow for clear classification and starts looking like a continuum, then we will lose this political effect of the LDC category. On the other hand, whatever the level of the indicator, it will be too aggregated for us to be able to derive a menu of answers for it. And we will keep doing individual responses to individual challenges. That's the state of our discussions right now. But at this stage, whatever may happen, we're still very much using the current LDC categorization. Sorry if I was a bit long. No, thank you very much. It was very important to hear for the, from the Commission that you still like the category. In fact, you've mentioned everything about weapons, or, uh, which was the great commercial or trade measure for LDCs, which was a European measure, and even as part of your global Europe. And I remember what happened five years ago. We, in fact, helped you a little bit on that. We had, in fact, uh, adopted the three LDC identification criteria. There's the category and there's the criteria behind them and all of this very consistent. And then you ask the question of whether, you know, it would be a good thing to evolve these criteria. But if they're used, of course, we want them to be as relevant as possible, even if they're not too complex. Um, now, we have one last speaker, Ambassador Kondel, Hello, De permanent delegate of Bangladesh to UNESCO. Your Excellency, are you ready to take the floor at this stage? Can you, do you think you, do you th Sorry, I couldn't hear the translation. Uh, okay, uh, you, you have the floor if you will. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, well, let me first thank the organizers, the uh, French government, uh, UN, uh, OHR, LLS, CDP, OECD, FERDI, and uh, also for, the, for this opportunity to speak. Um, distinguished panelists and participants, uh, in three minutes, I'll try to make four points. Uh, and first, uh, my first point, um, first couple of points are on the index. Uh, that and I fully concur with Professor Ocampo's uh, observations. Um, you know, the first thing that uh, 
which has not been changed is the GNI per capita uh, as, as in the uh, criteria. Uh, our observation is that uh, in most countries of the world, uh, the income distribution is skewed. <clears throat> and <clears throat> therefore, uh, <clears throat> sorry, the GNI per capita doesn't uh, always actually reflect the um, situation of the common people. So perhaps we could uh, look into um, uh, have taking the GNI per capita of the bottom 95% because uh, wealth distributions are uh, quite skewed. So that could be one thing that CDP could think of um, while, um, while uh, reformulating or, or, or fine tuning the criteria in future. Um, the second observation is regarding the vulnerability index, the EVI. And uh, <clears throat> here we see that uh, victims of disaster is uh, used as one of the, uh, the sub-criteria. Um, now, um, from our experience, you see, um, we are a country known for floods and cyclones, uh, but we have, uh, we have learned to live with it. Um, so in, when, you, when, you, um, when you have the, uh, the criteria in number of victims, well, perhaps the victims, the number of victims would not represent the actual impact of natural calamities and disasters. Um, therefore, uh, for, for, in, for instance, in our case, we lose, uh, according to some estimates, about 2% of our GDP annually. But since we have, uh, we now have a, a disaster awareness uh, uh, program in place, the casualties uh, from uh, natural disasters and calamities have uh, come down to a sort of minimum. Um, so therefore, uh, perhaps a recalibration of that. And, and it's also, you know, there are uh, LDCs which are uh, highly populated, which are less populated. For, for instance, the SIDS, which are also vulnerable to natural calamities, um, but there the number may be small. But the impact, as we just heard from uh, the uh, um, uh, Baroness Scotland, that uh, the case of Vanuatu, where sixty percent of the entire economy was wiped out, so that that's one area that I think that um, perhaps a little bit of thinking uh, could go in. Now, as a graduating LDC, we, you know, for the graduating LDCs, the concern uh, primarily is that. Uh, we don't know what next, what happens after we graduate. So it's, it's a totally uncharted territory for each and individual LDC which graduates. And therefore, there are these, uh, uh, some uh, say that there are this reluctance on part of the LDCs to graduate. Now, um, therefore, uh, perhaps we also need to think about the LDC uh, graduation sustainability index or have a certain study of which should accompany the um, which should accompany the um, uh, analysis for um, graduation of the LDCs and um, because in our, in our case we will be we will have huge uh, huge erosion of uh, preferences particularly in terms of trade, uh, according to some studies, we lose about 9% of our exports. And, um, and there are also um, the access to the, uh, access to the uh, concessional funding would also be, uh, would also be lost in. Excuse me, I couldn't hear you anymore. My apologies, oh. keep going. No, no, sorry. Um, so that is, I mean, in our case, uh, I was talking about the uh, erosion of preference in terms of trade, in terms of access to, um, access to um, uh, concessional uh, financing, and these will, of course, have an impact once we graduate. Therefore, 
the graduation sustainability also needs to be studied, uh, perhaps. Um, and uh, when I talk about this uh, uh, loss of trade, 9% loss of trade, as you know, it has got, I mean, we have benefited so much from the uh, preferential access, which has actually um, uh, made it possible for us to graduate. And we have, and particularly in our regiment garment sector, where we have about four, four million uh, women working, and there, there's a huge social impact to, to that. Um, so these are, these are some of the things. No, but, uh, excuse me, excuse me, that's a very, very, very important point, but it will be discussed at the next, next session. And uh, if we can focus just on the topic of this session to have a, a few minutes to have a discussion with, with the floor because uh, the time is... Uh, yes, sure, sure, sure. I mean, I was, I was just suggesting that we could have a graduation sustainability index or something uh, of that sort. Uh, to address and also to address those uh, areas, the emerging challenges for not only for the LDCs but for the, for the global challenges like, like, like we experienced with COVID and, uh, and then the impact of fourth industrial revolution and the technological divide, which are all uh, which will definitely be impacting the LDCs uh, and uh, how they will impact. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Excellency. Uh, we have now uh, five minutes to uh, hear some questions from the floor. Uh, no, no. Uh, maybe Fabien, have you um, collected some uh, question? I have no question on my side. Uh, I believe you should have some uh, that we printed out earlier. Well, we did, but they're not on this specific topic. Maybe I think if you could have a question, um, just to jump in, if you if you allow. Uh... Sure, sure, go, go ahead. Yeah. No, just maybe since we have here uh, such distinguished uh, panelists and we, we are all agreeing on the importance of the category, uh, maybe rethinking, fine-tuning some aspects of the category, and we have in front of us the uh, conference in Doha coming up uh, in a month, more or less. Um, what would be, for, from each one of the distinguished panelists that we have here, uh, the most successful result that you will hope for uh, in the Doha conference? If you could ask for one thing that you would like to see at the end of the conference, what do you think this thing should be? <laughs> so that, that's a terrible question, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, and if one of the panelists can uh, react or to the question of Federico or uh, even more to react to the other presentation because uh, uh, the points uh, um, presented um, are converging to some extent, but uh, not uh, fully. Um, and uh, je voudrais peut-être qu'on puisse éclaircir Le, le rôle que uh, les panélistes veulent jouer, veulent voir jouer à la... And I think it's interesting to see exactly what it's going to, to see, what the panelists who would like to have to say about a vulnerability of certain countries, because obviously we understand that it is a fundamental point. And I think it has been highlighted quite well in one of the LDC identification criteria. And I heard uh, uh, Patricia, uh, when she was speaking, she was talking uh, about the uh, intensity of cyclones and the impact it has on Vanuatu and how it's uh, more and more taken on in criteria and that are used by uh, Commonwealth countries. Now, we don't want to go into too many technical details today because that's not what we're here to talk about. But I think it's generally speaking, the question is, do we need to move towards a place in where the category fully uh, fully accounts for, without going into too much detail, the true vulnerability of each country when faced with climate change? Maybe just uh, a a, f a quick, a few quick comments uh, about the general philosophy behind the category from our panelists. Uh, now, I, 
I heard um, Ambassador Ligoya, who felt that was unfortunate that the International Monetary Fund and other international organizations don't, don't use these sorts of categories. Now, is that uh, something that uh, they should do? Should they change categories? I think that's an interesting topic we could just quickly touch upon, especially when talking about the rationale behind uh, the these criteria, and especially when it comes to multidimensional vulnerability. Because obviously, vulnerability is such a prime topic given the current climate and the current times. So I, I guess my question is, well, actually, I have some questions here. We have a question that just came in from Susan Kamara on the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and the criteria so that they don't use their criteria. Well, it's interesting because they have such a fundamental look at uh, income levels of countries and certain uh, and high income, low middle, middle income countries, but also they have, they take into account certain criteria of climate change vulnerability. And it's more and more a an issue that uh, such international financial organizations do look at. But this, that said, there's still a fair way to go for those concerns to be truly reflected in uh, criteria for the PM for the LDCs. Any any final comments uh, just from our panelists? Hello, Professor. Oui. Oh, Excellent. Yes, uh, I believe that uh, we need to engage everybody in this uh, issue of redefining uh, the criteria. For the World Bank and the IMF, we are very, very willing uh, to engage with them and, uh, and uh, come to an understanding. The problem we currently have is that when they, the World Bank and the IMF, generalize tendencies that are for low-income countries. Within that group of low-income countries, you find a, a panoply of uh, countries that are so different. So generalizing for all those countries uh, does not give us the specificity of the fragility and uh, uh, and the vulnerabilities of the LDCs. I have tried, uh, we have tried as the LDC group uh, to engage them, but we are very open uh, to discuss this with them. Now, the work that the CDP is doing uh, for the multidimensional vulnerability index is work that was originally meant for the small island developing states. And the, we hope that when the work is finished, we, the LDCs, can be able to use that index as well in, and to be that to be included in the definition of uh, LDCs. We have heard about uh, the proposal of another index, which is uh, the environmental vulnerability index. We would welcome that as well to be included if we come up with such an index for that to be included in the definition. One thing we are very happy with is that 
the definition is dynamic. It has not been the same definition all throughout. So with the same spirit of redefining, reclassifying our countries, uh, 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 I wish to propose that we continue uh, you researchers to help us uh, in, in, in that field, that uh, we continue uh, uh, having a relook at that. But uh, uh, Professor Patrick, uh, you are central to all this and you can help us with this engagement of uh, how we move forward from here. But in short, there is a, a true necessity for us to keep refining uh, the criteria. I thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Excellency, for your uh, uh, supporting and uh, <laughs> encouragement. Uh, we'll do uh, uh, the best we can. But um, I understand that uh, the Right Honorable uh, Patricia Scotland has also requested the probe, maybe for a point uh, close to yours. And uh, I think uh, there is uh, still a lot of work to do. But um, let me refer to the work which has been done by the Commonwealth Secretary and, and published, as well as a, a report issued uh, two days ago by uh, UNDESA on uh, the report to the Secretary General on uh, the um, um, uh, building of multi MVI, multi vulnerability. Uh, multidimensional vulnerability index. Um, Patricia, could you say a few words? Um, can I just say that um, this has been a fascinating debate, but I think those who are frightened that the multidimensional vulnerability index will add complexity, and by that I take it they mean unnecessary and uncalled for complexity. Can I just say I fundamentally disagree? because we are now dealing with an inherently more complex situation where the exogenous shocks to which we are um, subject are not dependent on our own fiscal rectitude and it is out with our control. So the reality of where we find ourselves in 2021 is very different from the position that was perceived 50 years ago when it was felt that GDP was a good and sound indicator of how an individual country was managing their economy in order to meet the needs of their people. So I do think that it is not out with our ability to come up with an index which is sufficiently flexible but will really speak to the reality of the country's lives, particularly the least developed and the small vulnerable countries who, no matter how fiscally prudent they are, they cannot deal with that which is out with their country. And I believe in Doha, we can and we should strive to come up with an index which speaks to the reality of people's lives. And I think, Patrick, we can do it. And I'm not a pessimist about this because um, it is deliverable and it is the task of our generation to do it. And we must. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Patricia, for this uh, important comment, as well as uh, those of uh, uh, Ambassador Ligoya. Um, we have to, to end this session. Uh, let me add a few, few words. We also have someone in the audience who raised a hand who wanted to make a comment. Sorry, what was that, Fabienne? Yes, it was Fabienne. Um, on a une person in the public who has levé la main, c'est Monsieur Edem Gadegbeki. 
Oui, mais nous, nous, il faut que nous arrêtions maintenant la session. Je crois qu'il faut conclure, conclure à partir des questions qui ont été posées, notamment une dernière question. Uh, try and take into account those uh, questions in later sessions. So there was one question about the role of criteria and really what do we include in these criteria? What do they cover? And I don't think it was highlighted enough because whatever indicator you're trying to look at, to be it a vulnerability or the like, to come up with a criteria to identify LDCs or to allocate additional discretional resources, it needs to be something that takes into account exogenous vulnerabilities. It needs to be something that truly reflects the countries. Obviously, the indicator shouldn't just be something to use to, uh, to punish bad policy and to congratulate good policy. Here we're talking about the criteria for these categories and they pl play such a, a fundamental universal role to improve all countries, all countries from a structural point of view as well. But they need to be there so that the funds can be fairly allocated to countries who probably need it, be it through, uh, uh, be it through different means. Now, obviously, public policy that's taken into account via other instruments, international aid instruments. But that's what we want to look at here. We want to find ways of identifying those countries that are in a poverty trap, and the, the, an indicator that truly reflects the reality on the ground within those countries so that it truly reflects all forms of vulnerabilities, exogenous uh, vulnerabilities, such as climate change or the, or the like, or, or even other risks such as terrorism. So that's where our thought process needs to go. And I'd really like to thank all those who joined us. I'd like to thank Ambassador Lugoy, Secretary General, uh, Patrice Scotland as well. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the encouragement for us to continue thoughts in that vein. And just like the Commonwealth at the United, uh, United States, a lot of the groundwork has already been done. So it's, uh, it's uh, important for us to keep abreast of those changes in the future and also to be part of that. I'm awfully sorry, but I will have to put an end to the session right now and move on to the next one. Let's just have a five minute break before we move on to the next session. And then we'll move into se the second session where we'll be talking about the impact that this category has had on countries themselves and then we'll touch on a little later on forecasts and perspectives that this can have in terms of impact to reduce structural handicaps. So we will stop there just for a few minutes, just a two minute break. We'll be back at five past. Just a quick, uh, quick glass of water if you'd like, uh, maybe get a quick coffee and then we'll be back. And it's unfortunate that we can't uh, be all together so we can't all share a coffee. But uh, there's unfortunately those uh, coffee break chats, we'll have to have them the next time. See you back in a few minutes. Participants, dear colleagues, if we could go back to our session, I see that Mathieu is ready. Mathieu, je te passe le bâton, s'il plaît. Can you all hear me? Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Federico. Thank you and hello to all of you, those of you who are with us this afternoon and who would be with us for the, the category of uh, the, the LDC categories. In the, this anniversary of the LDC category, we see as a uh, the speakers earlier said that this category remains uh, relevant, uh, particularly regarding the identification of uh, vulnerabilities, uh, vulnerabilities which more and more seem to be a major problem in LDCs uh, and something which will continue to uh, evolve and adapt to the context as mentioned earlier on. But if we look at these 50 years, we could look at the impact of the of belonging to the category to the PMA, to the LDC category. There, there's a lot of work uh, has been done uh, by UNCTAD, the, the CDP secretariat, and others, and uh, on this uh, category. And none 
of these surveys deal with the, the belonging, the impact of the belonging to this category. And there is a reason for that, that this impact is very difficult to measure. You have to make it, be able to make a distinction between what uh, concerns the belonging to this category and what concerns other factors which have an, an impact on the development of countries. So therefore, it is uh, difficult to, to identify that. And it is by trying to overcome this methodological difficulty that the, the book Out of the Trap was published under the, the Patrick Dumont and the new uh, version should uh, be uh, pub published uh, just before Doha in the coming weeks. So during this second session, which I have the pleasure to monitor, I propose we discuss uh, the belonging to this category, which uh, uh, you will find in the first two to three chapters of uh, the, this book. So we will discuss the impact of the LDC status on the growth and uh, uh, poverty reduction, then impact on the ODA and impact on a trade, which we have already discussed earlier on. So three mini panels, which will come one after the other, and then we will be able to take the questions from the public. Without further ado, I, we move on to the first panel where we ask the question regarding the global impact of the support measures on poverty and growth, and how and when can we consider that, that, that the, their impact has really uh, allowed it to deal with a structural handicaps. So we'll try to come up with an answer to this question and we will listen to a presentation of Jean-Louis Ercan. Good, good afternoon, Jean-Louis. I can see that you're connected. He's a professor with the university uh, in the University of Geneva and he was involved in the drafting of a, a collective agreement called Out of the Trap. And I would like to say that this uh, population, this uh, presentation was prepared with Alessandra Rabo, who is online, who has strongly contributed to, uh, to the challenge of this uh, book and we will listen to two comments made by Professor Usubu Dauda, who is also the new uh, Chancellor of the Ottawa University and I would like to congratulate him for his recent uh, uh, election and the other one was who is the Director General of Economics and Plan Planning in the Ministry of Egan. Uh, development of Burkina Faso is also a senior researcher with the Thomas Ankara University and both are the focal points uh, of, 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 of one for 31 in uh, Niger and the other one in Burkina Faso. So the floor is yours, Professor. I'll start out in English. It'll, it'll be easier for a lot of people. So, um, first of all, I'm not at the University of Geneva. I'm at the Graduate Institute, the SRED. People make that mistake all the time, but don't worry. Uh, it's up the hill. We're smaller, more nimble better. Uh, anyway, um, so what I'm here to talk about is how to try to identify a causal effect of uh, LDC status on uh, growth, essentially, on GDP per capita. I'm basi I'm basically, what I'm going to basically do is just sort of show you what we've tried to do. This is a classic impact evaluation problem, uh, because again, if you sort of think of this intuitively from the, from the econometric standpoint, we have a we have a structural equation, which is essentially uh, on the left-hand side, we have growth rate of GDP per capita or some other measure, but I'm going to focus on GDP per capita and show you, show you results uh, which have to do with GDP per capita, growth rate of GDP per capita. This is a function of a bunch of covariates, all sorts of, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, this is a cottage industry trying to figure out what, what are the determinants of, uh, of GDP per capita. Um, and then LDC status. And what's the main problem here? Well, the main problem obviously is that we have truckloads of reverse causality in that uh, LDC status to a large degree is determined by uh, poor growth performance and low levels of, uh, of GDP per capita. So we have a classic endogeneity problem uh, and we have to try to solve that endogeneity problem. Uh, and moreover, we have to do this with uh, cross-country data, uh, which itself is extremely dirty uh, and poor. Um, and the first problem that we encounter is that essentially differences in growth rates of GDP per capita between countries are to a large extent determined by between-country differences. So doing something 
fairly standard doing this with country specific fixed effects and um, relying essentially on within country variation in growth rates of GDP per capita. Well, basically, in, to, to a certain extent, we, we, we would throw out the baby with the bathwater. Uh, and this is particularly true because there is almost no variance over time or very little variance over time uh, in LDC status. So the, the, the problem that we have here is a classic impact evaluation problem of trying to find the appropriate counterfactual. That's, that's the key word here is, is counterfactual. Now, there are various types of counterfactuals that we've uh, thought about and which are detailed in, 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 in Out of the Trap, and Patrick has developed these uh, at great length, and that has to do with you know, the, the discordant countries, uh, which uh, satisfy, uh, uh, do not satisfy the, the, the criteria for inclusion. Um, and, and so there's, there's, there's a lot of work that, that, that's included in the book uh, on this. I invite you to go and, and, and look at that work because it's actually very interesting. But that's not really sufficient to tease out uh, a causal impact. Now, in what I'm going to talk about now, let me divide the, uh, the period because the, the key thing here, and this is in some sense the first stage reduced form of this, uh, of this, uh, of this regression work, is what determines LDC status. So here we have two historical periods. We have the, uh, the 1971 to 1990 historical period, where we have uh, you know, GDP per capita, literacy rate, and share of manufacturing. And then we have the 1991 to, uh, in our case, the data that we're using 2015, uh, where we have GNI per capita, population size, uh, either EDI or EVI, uh, the uh, APQLI or HAI, I mean, you know, je vous passe les détails, uh, these things change over time, but these are criteria. So as an impact evaluation person, when one sees this, the treatment status, and let's talk about it as treatment status because this really is an impact evaluation problem. This is sort of nice also in the, the, uh, the most recent Nobel Prize in economics was uh, awarded to, uh, as you probably know, to, to, to Josh Angrist and uh, and uh, David Card and, uh, and Guido Imbens. And the method that Alassane and myself implemented to try to actually tease out a causal effect with very limited success, unfortunately, so that's the spoiler alert. Uh, so very, li very limited success here uh, in terms of uh, statistical significance, in terms of the precision of the estimates is what's known as RDD, which is regression discontinuity design. And as a lot of you probably know, RDD was introduced into the economics literature uh, in 1999, in this famous paper by Angrist and Lavi, they were looking at uh, this, the impact of class size on, um, on uh, uh, academic outcomes. Uh, and we're exactly in this situation here. So just to, 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 to make it clear in terms of what the methodology is, what we essentially have here is what's known as a fuzzy RDD, because there are countries which satisfy, you know, depending on the historical period we're looking at and depending upon the criteria that we're looking at, we have countries which satisfy the criteria and it's, it's, these are, this is a multi-dimensional set of criteria, right? So it's not one criterion uh, as is typically done in most RDD work. Uh, and then we also have country which countries which satisfy the criteria, but which are not classified as LDC. So this is what's known as a, as, a, as, a, as a fuzzy RDD. And the basic idea of the, of, the, of the fuzzy RDD is essentially to run what boils down to an IV regression, an instrumental variables regression, uh, where uh, the exclusion restriction is given by what? It's given by the theoretical treatment status that should be ascribed to the country. Okay, so what we basically have is a bunch of criteria, okay? And then the key thing is that certain countries should be LDCs if they satisfy all the criteria. That's the theoretical treatment status. And that's our exclusion restriction. And the idea in the fuzzy RDD is that, is that that theoretical treatment status shouldn't have any direct effect on the growth rate of GDP per capita. The only effect that it should have on the growth rate of GDP per capita is through its effect on the likelihood that the country actually is uh, classified as uh, an LDC. 
So that's, that's the, the theoretical setting. There are various ways in which one can do this. Um, let me just show you just to make this concrete. I'm gonna share my screen. Oops, no, but I can't share my screen. Uh, Fabienne, you have to allow screen sharing by the speaker. Thank you very much. Yeah. Sorry, I did not get your document, but that's fine. I have it here. This is a typical type of result that we get uh, when we apply this. So this is on the 1991-2015 uh, uh, time frame where the what are known uh, in the uh, what's known in the RDD literature as the forcing variables are the population size, GNI per capita, EVI, HI. Well, I mean, again, it, it sort of moves between EDI and EVI and APQLI and HAI. And what you should look at in this result is sort of typical, unfortunately, of the results that we get. So, again, the growth rate of GDP per capita, so if it's a 3% growth rate, it's three, okay. You notice that in almost all cases, the impact, that's the stuff which is in, uh, that's the stuff which is in boldface up there is uh, negative. Uh, but what you also notice is that the confidence intervals are huge. That's the second line where it says robust 95% confidence interval. So these estimates, and this is sort of best practice in the sense that this is using this is using uh, essentially sort of a, a, a this is using non-parametric methods. So we're not restricting things into the straight track jacket of, uh, of, 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 uh, of a parametric specification. Uh, and what you basically find is that this is extremely noisy. We're not able to establish a tightly estimated uh, causal effect. And basically the reason that this is happening is pretty clear. The reason, the reason for which this is happening is because we actually have very little within country variance, and actually even in terms of the sample, in terms of between country variance in uh, LDC status uh, over this period in 1991 to 2015. So uh, in some sense, that's bad news, right? Because we're not, and, and you know, however we torture the data and we torture it, uh, and Alassane can go into, you know, more details on how we tortured the data, uh, many different ways of torturing the data, try as hard as we might, we were unable to make these estimates become any more precise. So to identify uh, a specific uh, and tightly estimated impact of uh, belonging to the LDC category. To some extent, this is unsurprising because this is an IV, this is an instrumental variables estimation method. And as we know, instrumental variable estimation methods basically blow up standard errors. So these things are always extremely noisy. Uh, so that's not exactly not exactly uh, surprising. Of course, this 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 work is subject to all the usual critiques uh, of uh, cross country growth regressions. Uh, so there's the standard Batsy Clements and company uh, critiques of this. It could be, and this is let me let me sort of finish on an optimistic note. It could be that. Uh, there's still scope for a little bit of work on this. I was thinking about this the other day on how one might be able to improve this. And the, I think that the way probably to go is to use some sort of synthetic control method. Uh, this is stuff that Alberto Abadi and, and company have been, have been thinking about, uh, well, have been developing and developed a few years ago. And we would have to combine some sort of synthetic control because the whole problem is that we have a very small counterfactual. The counterfactual is very small, and we just can't invent a counterfactual, which doesn't exist. And with that, uh, I'm going to stop and uh, pass the uh, the floor back to uh, Mathieu. Merci uh, beaucoup, Jean-Louis. Uh, Thank si you je... very much, Jean-Louis. If I try to summarize uh, what you're telling us is that it is very difficult and just let me know if i say something uh, uh, that is not true it's very difficult to answer the question we uh, ask ourselves and the, uh, the work done on that and the few surveys uh, got rid of, there are things that may be positive uh, over a period of time but nevertheless the methodological uh, issues do not allow us uh, to uh, affirm that with uh, certainty and without errors that's what you said 
So actually, what you're saying is that uh, what is your conclusion? We have to conclusion. We have to continue to work on this type of data and this uh, kind of problems. Let me just say something. Maybe Alassane could first uh, show us a graphic so which show uh, that, that there are changes in the trends, which is important for the category. Is Alassane online? Maybe Alassane, during the questions and answer session, will be able to say more about that. Could we now listen to two comments following this presentation? And mainly the first one is that of Professor Mohamedou Daouda. Professor Daouda, are you online? So Professor Dauda was online earlier on. Is he back? <laughs> oh, maybe Professor Kubiakda. I think we've lost. No, Mr. Kubiakda. Mr. Kubiakda, you're there. I can see you, but I, we cannot hear you. Good evening, Mathieu, and good evening uh, to all of you. When we follow the presentation of Jean-Louis, who tried to show that for countries, uh, LDC countries, we have no uh, factual evidence which allows us to say more and say know more about the situation in which they find themselves. Uh, regarding Burkina Faso, I may, me, I would like to highlight a certain number of contextual uh, uh, aspects before discussing some results, even though some of the results are mitigated, as uh, was said by the speaker. So we started with the first action program uh, the, of 2010, and following the uh, evaluation of this program, we uh, look at that the Istanbul program of action. Uh, 2011 to 2020, and this program, the objective of this program, the main objective was to overcome the structural problems existing for LDCs, uh, Burkina Faso being one of them. And for its operationalization, uh, we uh, wanted to work so as to uh, reduce poverty more and achieve the SDGs at the international and the global level and uh, graduate our country from this LDC category. And uh, uh, nevertheless, a large number of countries were not able to graduate. And despite all the efforts uh, made by these uh, countries, in the case of Burkina Faso, for instance, several actions uh, were uh, carried out. The main objectives of such actions being to increase the production uh, capacity of the country, which can be analyzed in terms of infrastructures to develop uh, uh, the uh, uh, electricity at the national level and the connectivity uh, issue to allow people to develop uh, production units. Regarding Burkina Faso more specifically, we have to uh, remind you that uh, agricultural and uh, rural development was one of the elements which could have a major impact on poverty, particularly um, uh, food uh, problems and uh, for children to improve the prevalence uh, or the, the, the impact on the, the children's weight and that this should be done through uh, actions carried out uh, with uh, the government. So we wanted to work also on uh, trade aspects and uh, improve the exports, the share of exports of the country. But that part of exports had to, has to increase. But some progress has been made, but the progress remains nevertheless uh, uh, very slow. 
uh, which did not allow the country to move in the direction expected. So we have the development of the private sector and an economy which is more connected to the, the rest of the world and the private sector could also offer jobs, but at the same time uh, could uh, create uh, wealth which would allow the country by mobilizing resources uh, to start a certain number of reforms and uh, develop the private sector. So the, we also wanted to work on these uh, core, uh, core projects. And for those of you who are familiar with Burkina Faso, the main uh, uh, products exported are just gold and in a more marginal way, the cotton and the sesame. And this proportion remains a relatively uh, low which uh, and gold has become the first uh, uh, to be exported and what we could qualify as export goods that uh, would not help us to create sufficient uh, added value include on human social aspects to characterize how the country has evolved in terms of its uh, GDP per capita. If you look at that figure, the country, the country's GDP depends on a number of factors. It has hardly gone up. And poverty looks erratic in the country over time. At some moments, growth has helped reducing poverty but if you adjust by using a number of other parameters it's all not it's not all that obvious something else that's even more in, important to us is the increase in inequalities even though absolute poverty sometimes seems to go down inequalities are blatant both between the sexes but also between rural and urban environments. And so this means that we're going to need to have more sophisticated studies in order to better understand what's happening. So those were the few major things that I wanted to put on the table. And I also wanted to you that as far as Burkina Faso, the fact that we belong to the LDC space has certainly helped in terms of the guidance that we've been given but it's not clear that it has directly influenced the growth of gdp per cap capita or that it has influenced directly the poverty levels so matthew there are a few elements that i wanted to table uh, but of course i'd be Happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Kogyakda. Let me now give over to Alassane, who's going to show you, us a few graphs. Alassane, if you're online, Alassane worked on the topic extensively with Professor Arcan. You now have the floor, and I think you also need to share your screen. Alassane, I don't know if you can hear us, but we can't hear you because your mic is muted. So rather than moving on to the next mini panel, I think I'd like to hear from Alassane on, on the same topic. If you don't have the graphs, Alassane, you just, just tell them verbally about the highlights. Well, there are two graphs that I'd like to show you. And I'm just finding it a little difficult to share them. Perhaps if you'll allow me, we could have the next speaker and that would give me time so that I can actually show you the graphs afterwards. Okay, well then let's move on to the next mini we're going to need to ask OECD to let you share your screen. Could Julia maybe allow Alassane to share his screen? That would be great. Um, but in order to gain a little time, uh, we're going to move on 
to the next mini panel. So I suggest that we move on to this question about the ability of the LCD LDC status to help countries attract more DA. We have Lisa Chauvet, who's a professor at the University of Paris One and a senior fellow at Ferdi, but also a co-author of the chapter on that, that question in Out of the Trap. And then we'll hear from Farmida Katoun, the executive director of the Center of Policy Dialogue in Bangladesh, as well as Jorge Moreira de Silva, director of uh, Development Cooperation, director at OECD. Jules Tapsoba, who is the IMF resident representative for Togo, wanted to speak, but he, at the last minute, he found himself unable to be with us. So Lisa, I think you too have something that you want to share with us. And we can't hear you yet, Lisa, at least I can't hear you. Well, I personally can't hear you, Lisa. No, still can't hear you, sorry. Experiencing some technical problems here. It is probably the audio, if you remove your uh, headphones, that may be... If you disconnect, yeah, that's probably the reason. What we could do is swap the order of the mini panels, which would give us time to solve these technical problems. Laurent Wagner. I think we have Laurent Wagner. Yes, I can see you, Laurent. The third mini panel. Lisa, can we hear you? Now, are you the one? Yeah, that we, yes. Okay, fantastic. But I don't think I can share my slides yet. Could somebody enable me to do that? We're going to ask our technician friends, Julien and Fabienne, to allow Lisa to share her PowerPoint presentation the one that Lisa sent to us earlier on. Okay, I'm going to start in the meantime, and as soon as I see that I can do it, I will do it. Oh, I already can do it. But, but you'll have to change uh, the pages for me. First of all, allow me to thank all of the Ferdi team for this invitation, for inviting me to present this chapter of the book, which was co-written with Patrick Guillaume, and also mobilized Laurent Wagner, Mathieu, Boussicha, and Alassane Drabo. The book is based on the consensus around the need to prioritize LDCs in allocated aid, and the idea was to confront this consensus and the commitments taken by the international community in order to examine whether there really is a priority given to aid to these countries. So I will remind ourselves very quickly of the rationale for this preference and then I'll present the main findings of our chapter. First of all, does ODA reach the objectives in terms of aid to LDCs? And even if it doesn't, is there still a preference given to LDCs in the aid allocation? Those are the two questions we ask in our study. Can we move on to the next slide? Thank you very much. There are two main foundations to the concept of 
giving preference to LDCs in aid allocation. The first one is fairness and equity. The idea being that at an equivalent level of effort, countries who have more structural handicaps should receive more um, official aid. And so the idea of taking structural handicap into consideration fully aligns with the very objective of the LDC category. So equity certainly is strongly aligned with this idea of preference to a number of countries. The second principle that underlies aid allocation and also means that least developed countries should receive more aid is the idea of reinforced efficiency and effectiveness for these countries because many studies have shown that official aid creates more growth or creates growth more efficiently when it is granted to countries that are more, more economically vulnerable because in those cases it can play a stabilizing role. This stabilizing role uh, can have several sources. It can be just counter-cyclical, but even if the aid is not counter-cyclical, and often it isn't, as has been shown, it can still be stabilizing, especially if it is relative to other um, macroeconomic aggregates or if it has very high amounts um, in light of sources of external shocks. So there's a stabilizing effect that has been proven when countries have uh, economic vulnerabilities allowing this aid to have a relatively higher marginal effect in vulnerable countries and so you might expect it to be the case also for least developed countries. The second reason that we have in terms of the increased effectiveness of aid in LDCs is the absorption capacity. There are studies on that too. Um, Patrick Guillemont, again, was the person who uh, conducted many of these studies. Uh, and it's clear that aid has a higher marginal effect in countries that are vulnerable or that have lower levels of education as measured, for example, um, through the HAI indicator. And all this suggests that these countries might be able to efficiently and effectively absorb more aid than other developing countries. As an illustration of this point, perhaps Fabien could show the next slide. Thank you very much. Now, this comes from an article written by Sylvain Dumont-Germenet and Patrick, showing that if you look at the successful World Bank projects, the rate of success differs as a function of the level of aid received by countries and also as a function of whether you're looking at non-LDC developing countries represented here by the uh, line with the small great squares or the LDCs, which are the black triangles on, on that other curve so that clearly non-LDC countries is a marginal effect that's higher but that marginal efficiency goes down as the level of aid goes up and the reverse is true for LDCs countries as the aid grows the yield remains positive whereas for non LDC developing countries, it goes down. Next slide, thank you. And all this justifies the fact that there has been a consensus on the need to allocate more aid to LDCs. And I don't want to dwell on these objectives because I think you all know them very well. Um, there are objectives in terms of amounts. That's uh, allocating at least 0.15% of your national income um, to LDCs. When you reach that figure, you can even reach 0.2% of GDP. 
And so those are commitments in terms of amounts, but also commitments in terms of practices, unbundling help to LD, uh, TCs, um, having a preference for grants, and a new definition of A that should favor LDCs would be a higher actualization rate. Uh, the eligibility threshold should be higher. It has been increased to 45% and it's lower for intermediary income countries and for um, high income countries. So if a donor allocates aid to LDCs, it should be more concessional. That's one of the criteria. Also, as I said, actualization rates have been higher, which makes it easier to account for a loan if it's directed towards an LDC. And the idea here is to create an encouragement to allocate more aid to LDCs. First way in which we can assess whether aid has reached its objective, which was the whole point of this chapter, was looking at the aid effort from donor countries. And to confront this effort with the commitments taken by the international community. And you can't see the full graph on the screen, but as you can see in pink, you have the aid effort over time from 1989 to 2017. And you see how it's evolved over time. This is A2 LDCs. It's hardly over the 0.1% of GDP mark. And let me remind you that the objective is 0.5% at least. You see a decrease in the 90s because of aid fatigue and collapse of the Soviet Union, so the post-Cold War situation. But then you also have the black and red lines, which show you that the trends are completely parallel and that the share of aid to LDCs or to other developing countries, in both cases, have been motivated by the international context and follow very similar trends. I'm going to need to ask you to maybe conclude quickly if it's possible. Well, I suppose. suppose then we are not going to spend too much time on the next slide. Let's skip that, actually. Can you move to the next slide? Yes, thank you. Well, here, all you see is the fact that, well, we've shown the relative effort of donors to LDCs on one axis and to all other developing countries on the other axis. And clearly, the group of countries where you've reached the 0.7% of the UN is also the group which in most cases reaches the 0.15% uh, for LDCs. So clearly there's heterogeneity across donors in terms of how they meet their objectives. So Fabian, if we could just go to the next slide. Thank you very much. What we wanted to show you here with this next uh, chart is that uh, LDCs, when it comes to predominant source of external revenues, it actually comes from, uh, from ODA. And it's actually quite a large percentage of the GDP, especially when looking at foreign di direct investment compared to remittances, net, of, net official development assistance, the three major aspects are, and remember, it's roughly 10, to 20% for LDCs and only about 5% for non-LDCs. Moving on to the next chart. Here we want to try and 
look at what Jean-Louis was telling us about a bit earlier. We wanted to distinguish between different countries by looking at what the effect of the category has on the countries. So being an LEC country, having that title, what does that mean for the country? Is the country facing structural handicaps? So we have looked at the level of aid, the level of handicap and the and the way it changed over time. So we are trying to look at that over here. So you have the date they joined the list, they became a member of the LDC category. So these are members who have probably received the most aid over time. And unfortunately, the chart is split over two columns here. What it shows, generally speaking, is that there is there is an effect from the date that a country joins uh, the list and uh, the date they reach that 1.5 percent. If we could move on to the next slide, please, Fabienne. So here, if we get into the nuts and bolts of the analysis, uh, for some structural analysis side of things, we actually did an econometrics type of estimation to see the effect of being part of the category would have on the overall amount of aid received by the country. So we looked at the GDP per capita and, popu and population and aid. And we looked at another var variable, we wanted to throw in a variable there, is the country LDC or not? And that's why we in included the LDC and you've got the LDC factor thrown in to the calculation there. And the LDC, it actually absorbs the impact coming from belonging to the category. And on top of that, the effect coming from structural handicaps and therefore, we came up with a second model to try and distinguish the two, which is why we have criteria thrown into the mix there. So we've got structural change, LDC and criteria. And that's why we can try and see where the two effects come from. So if we move on to the next slide, we should see the conclusions from that. And what we have is that the poorest countries receive the most amount of aid, but belonging to the category, LDC category, doesn't necessarily have a positive impact on estimations. Nevertheless, we see that there is an over time this convergence between access to aid for LDCs and and other developing countries. So when we look over over the issues that LDCs used to face, is that they often often had hard access. It was difficult for them to access aid, but. But what we do see is that when we throw into the factor of vulnerability, we actually see that vulnerable countries tend to receive more aid as opposed to just developing countries or LDC type countries, which is interesting when we look at the vulnerability notion there. So if we could quickly move on to the next slide, please, so I can wrap up my speech. So the specific way of looking at LDCs based on issues of fairness and efficacy, it justifies certain commitments made from the international community in terms of international aid. But ultimately, the objectives set by the international community were not attained. But as insofar as a country joins the list of LDCs, they get a bit of a boost in terms of aid, 1.5 to 3% boost, depending on periods. What we also see is that the amount of aid a country will receive depends on the level of poverty and vulnerability in the countries. And that's uh, that really the main uh, points I wanted to raise. Thank you very much for that. So we have Famida Khatun with us now. So Famida Khatun is executive director for the Center of Policy Dialogue in Bangladesh. So, Dr. Kutun, over to you. <clears throat> thank you very much. Good afternoon to everyone. And thank you very much, Lisa, for um, this excellent presentation and this excellent analysis you have done on the ODA for the least developed countries. So I would just, you know, add a few uh, or um, emphasize a few issues which have been presented in uh, Lisa's uh, slides. Um, first point is that uh, the experience regarding the um, ODA or aid 
is that the relationship between ODA and growth is not automatic and it's not straightforward. In fact, there have been several studies which have uh, pointed out and established um, to uh, findings, evidences, empirical analysis is that it depends on the both on the domestic and external fact factors. At the domestic level, uh, the issues of capacity, you have touched upon that the capacity uh, is a constraining fa factors for many LDCs um, as a result of which they cannot absorb, they cannot utilize. The utilization capacity, the absorption capacity is uh, crucial also. And the other issue which has been highlighted, the issue of alignment with the national preferences. Uh, in many cases, the projects or programs are selected in such a way which are not aligned with the national priorities. And for that, I, it is not uh, only the donor's responsibility. In fact, it is the responsibility of the national governments uh, themselves to choose or to pick the priority areas. So that happens when there is uh, the issue of capacity, but also the issue of governance. In many cases, the governance, weak governance uh, also uh, act as a deterrent to the efficient and effective use of uh, foreign aid or the ODA. So, and the issue of structural bottlenecks within the countries um, are also uh, barriers for effective uh, aid utilization and the effective outcome. Uh, and this has been experienced in many countries. In case of the external factors, also the issue of the predictability, because in, in many cases, I mean, the issue of, of course, these principles have been set and countries or development partners are to follow that. But the issue of predictability is it's still a challenge that whether there will be a continuity of programs uh, or support, that's an issue which, it, which disrupts implementation of many important uh, programs. The other issue is the quality and quantity. In terms of quantity, the LDCs, many LDCs, um, in fact, particularly those are now in the context of COVID-19, uh, the issue of higher um, and uh, quality aid is very important. As we know that in case of the uh, commitment um, during the 2030 uh, agenda for sustainable development that donors should um, target for a higher commitment that for the LDCs, that's one um, area where commitments are still to be fulfilled. And then the issue of quality also, whether this aid is going towards sustainable development or not and whether it is uh, used or put up uh, as a best possible use um, in case of the um, uh, in the project selection of projects or uh, areas the so the issue of scaling up is important scaling up uh, of financing uh, for the um, ldcs the um, other issue, the slides which have been shown um, just towards the end, the graphs um, Lisa has shown regarding the, you know, uh, the comparative share of various external resources, ODA is at the top. Uh, but I think, you know, when you disaggregate, it varies from country to country. Why I'm saying that? Because Bangladesh being an LDC, it is an outlier. Um, ODA, uh, in fact, the contribution of ODA has been declining and it is only about 2% of GDP. So major sources of external um, finance in case of Bangladesh is remittance, export, and then uh, FDA and, and ODA. So, um, and however, it doesn't mean that you can, uh, Bangladesh uh, can do away with uh, the uh, ODA because there is a need for ODA for uh, social sectors. We have uh, undertaken a study which shows that areas such as health and education are still uh, a benefit, uh, benefit. They, these two sectors benefit from the ODA and these are crucial 
And many of these are channeled through various non-government sources, non-government organizations are implementing many programs which reach to the marginalized people who are left, left behind. So this is uh, the, the importance of, of ODA is still there. And it, is, it will be still uh, important for quite some time in the sense that the country um, is going through a number of you know, changes and uh, transitions, you can say, and also some challenges. Transition in the sense that the uh, country is going through double graduation, that Bangladesh is set to graduate from LBC to developing country by 2026. And it also aims for becoming an upper middle income country by 2031. Then the commitment for SDG implementation. And then the issue of the or the impact of COVID-19, which has reversed many of the achievements, not only in Bangladesh, many other illnesses, in fact, across the world, or all the countries have faced the wrath of this. And still they are now they are trying to build forward better. So in this journey, in order to have a smooth uh, graduation and uh, Bangladesh and all the other graduating LDCs for a smooth graduation, the importance of external resources, external finance, and a higher amount of, you know, and quality finance would be still very important. And uh, particularly when, uh, as I have mentioned, that social uh, aspects, uh, COVID-19 has shown that how these social sectors, the health sector, how uh, weak they are, how the unprepared this the sector is in taking care of the you know of the patients and also so when we recover when we think about build back better or build forward better the um, the requirement for a robust health system with affordability and accessibility uh, that that will be one very important um, aspect in order to achieve this uh, sustainable development goal. The other issue is that we Dr. education. Dr. You conclude, please? I will just finish with this. Yeah, 30 seconds. Yeah. The education, you, uh, the uh, because of you know uh, weak infrastructure, lack of access to internet technology, students have been um, affected hugely. And only a you know, handful of uh, educational institution could provide online education. So the, the huge uh, damage uh, on the education system, which is system, which is a social capital, that is also uh, you know, a very important aspect for uh, reaching or achieving the SDGs. So the need for, uh, more, uh, for more ODA in education and in, in case of developing the human capital is very important. It's not only for Bangladesh, but also for all other LDCs. So I would um, say that in future, when uh, countries are designing their development uh, support, these are the areas where they have to focus on. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, euh, Dr Katoun. Et je précise qu'au Bangladesh, il est déjà à plus de 10 heures du soir. Et je, je vous remercie d'autant plus de vous être rendu disponible aujourd'hui. Euh, euh, je, sans plus attendre, je passe la parole à, euh, au directeur euh, Morira Da Silva euh, de l'OCDE. Without further ado, we'll hand over to Mario De Silva from the OECD. Thank you very much, and thank you to Ferdi at the Development Center. And, Thank you to our UN colleagues. Thank you very much for inviting me to be here to, uh, to speak. comments provided by uh, Fahima on, on, on this important uh, topic. I think that it's impossible to discuss uh, the, the concerns faced by uh, LDCs without discussing ODA, but we, can, but we shall not really limit this conversation to ODA and to quantity. So, but let me start with quantity and with ODA, and then let me move to other to other dimensions. On quantity and based on on the the facts that we provided, as you know, we are the custodians of ODA. Uh, we receive all data from uh, our members at the DAC, but also um, own our members to to account in their commitments. Clearly, uh, the ODA continues to play a. Um, 
a central role in, in, the, in LDC's financing mix. Uh, for instance, uh, from 2018-2019, uh, ODA to LDC's reached 52% of total uh, external inflows, and this shall be compared with 11% uh, for other developing uh, countries. Uh, and even in the middle of the, of the crisis, uh, all the 12 DCs has demonstrated uh, continued political will from uh, donors and, and solidarities despite the crisis in 2020. Uh, the hate flows um, to LDCs amounted to $34 billion, uh, increasing by almost 2%. Uh, this is consistent with what we have seen in the uh, in the last two decades, with a steady, steady growth uh, on average of 5.8% uh, on uh, support to uh, LDCs compared to 2.9% uh, for non-LDCs. Uh, but obviously, there is no room for complacency because, as Lisa mentioned. Uh, we are uh, well below the commitment of 0.15 uh, 15 to 0.2%. In 2019, uh, it represented 0.09%. Uh, uh, so this is my first note on volumes on ODA, uh, showing that clearly this remains a priority for uh, the DAC, the support to LDCs. Uh, but obviously, uh, the relevance of, of ODA goes beyond uh, uh, quantity and the fact that uh, LDCs uh, are eligible and priority for ODA uh, carries other advantages such as, uh, first of all, uh, it means that uh, LDCs benefit from higher levels of constitutionality uh, of ODA loans and receive a higher proportion of grants. Uh, second, uh, they benefit from the DAC recommendation on untying uh, uh, aid, untying, untying ODA. And finally, uh, in recognition to their financing challenges, LDCs also benefit from other specific uh, ODA-related measures. Uh, and let me just mention one, the aid for trade. Um, the aid for trade disbursements to LDCs have grown at a faster pace than to other countries at 8.2% uh, on average per year over the period of uh, 26 to 2019. Uh, However, uh, we must, we shall discuss uh, uh, these challenges beyond uh, ODA. And uh, while we must mobilize more uh, and better ODA, uh, we really need to focus on, on uh, leveraging uh, ODA to improve the mobilization of alternative sources of finance. Uh, tax revenues uh, are on average lower in LDCs than in, in other developing countries, but, but I would like to, to emphasize the, the real challenges regarding the, the attraction of external private finance. And I'll just share two figures that I think are quite eloquent of, of this challenge. Um, from our uh, data, uh, while the volume of private uh, finance uh, for, uh, for LDCs is increasing over time uh, and has accelerated uh, in recent years, it still accounts for only 6% of all private finance mobilizing. So you can see that while blended finance is on the rise, everybody's talking about blended finance, only 6% of blended finance is going to LDCs. Uh, and this is really a, 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 an important issue. If, if we look to what is happening on climate, it, it's also quite paradoxical. Uh, um, developing countries are all uh, disproportionately affected by climate crisis, but especially LDCs. Uh, and we see that from all private finance uh, in LDCs, only 37% is targeting climate action, uh, amounting to 1.6 billion on, on average. So this is uh, well below what is needed to net zero transition. Um, so beyond the debate on, on and I'm almost concluding, Matteo, beyond, beyond the debate on, on all the quantity uh, and amounts, uh, and also the discussions about private finance to be mobilized. It's also important to pay uh, attention to the quality of the assistance as both Lisa and uh, Fah Fahimida uh, uh, emphasize that, that we need to well target uh, our response to the specific needs of, of developing countries. Uh, we need to have uh, the right terms and conditions to take in consideration the macro fiscal context of partner countries, especially 
the sustainability of their debt. And we need to align all finance uh, 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 with SDGs and with the Paris Agreement. And finally, we need to look on to partnership beyond ODA. Uh, several countries are graduating. We heard from Bangladesh. The same has happened with, with other countries. And we know that uh, given the LDC's high dependence on ODA and the risk of financing gap uh, posed by the phase out of ODA, uh, once countries move, uh, move up into in the income ladder, increased efforts uh, are needed from development partners to, to, to help LDCs better mobilize domestic resources and leverage private finance at an early stage. So I, I want really to conclude by, by emphasizing this dimension of partnership uh, uh, beyond uh, uh, ODA and the need to ensure that we have a good transition uh, in the support to LDCs as they graduate and they transition uh, in the income uh, ladder. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Directeur. Je vois que la, la question de la qualité de l'aide revient très, très souvent. Thank you very much, Director. I see that you often hear about the quality of aid. Before moving to the third mini panel, I would like to switch to the first one because we had some technical problems. And I'll give the floor to Alassane Rabot, who is, I believe, ready to show us one or two graphs. Alassane, it's all yours. Yes, Mathieu. Hello, Mathieu. Hello, everybody. And thank you very much for your invitation to this uh, important event. I would like to thank Jean-Louis for the presentation of chapter one of our book, uh, Out of uh, Trap, which was uh, a nice presentation. I just would like to add a few elements to his presentation. The first thing I would like to say is uh, uh, concerns the, the number of LDCs. On the graph you will see in a short while. On this graph you can see very clearly that the blue line shows us the development of, uh, for, for LDCs since uh, from the very moment the category was created. And we realize that, that the number of LDCs has not increased much up to the year 2000. And it is in the years of 2000 that we saw a reduction in the number of LDCs. And this can be explained mainly by the fact that um, to start with, some LDCs uh, had problems or were afraid to graduate uh, because they were afraid of what would happen after the graduation. They were afraid they would lose some of their advantages. And you can see that there is a curve representing the number of LDCs uh, that do not meet uh, the inclusion criteria. Yes, so we cannot see the read the legend, so just uh, Please use the colors. Yes, I have this graph. But I have the next graph too. But normally on the PowerPoint, you should be able to read the legend. You can't just read it. No, no. But you, we have to go on fast because for the part, the participants to the other panels are in the waiting room. Uh, uh, they're, they're waiting. <laughs> And we have the third point on train, which we would like to deal with uh, quickly. So if Alassane could uh, show us uh, the graph on the expected the growth uh, rates, and then we'll have to move to the next session. No problem, Mr. Clement. So let us, uh, this is uh, another graph, which is very important. This graph represents the growth rates of LDCs and other developing countries. And for the other developing countries, we have two categories, all the developing countries and also the developing countries, which it have at once, uh, uh, at least once have been uh, low income countries. So when we look at this graph, we can see that it could be divided into two big major chunks. Before 1995, we realized that the growth rate for LDCs was very low compared to other developing countries. And as of 1995, the LDCs have improved their growth rate and have growth rates which are comparable to that of uh, the developing countries and the countries with low uh, or low income countries, some of them being uh, middle income countries. 
During the next decade, the, the, the subsequent decade, the situation has improved when it comes to the growth rate. In the book, we explain the reasons, but since we don't have much time here, uh, I won't say more. Thank you very much for giving me the, for the possibility to present these two graphs. And thank you very much to Jean-Louis for his uh, great presentation and to Mathilde Messigimo for giving me the floor. Have a nice meeting. Thank you very much, Alassane. I've seen that Professor Dauda is back because he has con had connection problems. Could you be very short, very brief, please? Because we're very late. Could you, in three minutes, uh, just share with us your comments? Yes. Professor Dauda. I think we have a connection problem, so let us now move on to the third panel. We can see you, but we cannot hear you. <laughs> Thank you very much to all of you. So without further ado, we can move on to the third panel, which uh, concerns the marginalization of LDCs, the trade marginalization, and see whether the, this marginalization was reversed thanks to their LDC status and the advantages that come with the status. I will now give the floor to Laurent Wagner, who is a researcher. This was present, This presentation was present, prepared with Céline Carrick, who is also a senior fellow at Ferdi, and who very much regrets she cannot be with us today. And she's the author of the chapter uh, dedicated to this point in the book called Out of the Trap. Laurent, the floor is yours. I give you the floor immediately. Thank you very much, Mathieu. Can you do that in less than 10 minutes because we're very late? Uh, excuse me. Uh, please forgive me. Yes, that's what I was going to say. As being the last panelist, I will try to um, make a mini, mini panel. I had sent you slides yesterday. Could I show the slides or should I do it my, by myself? Okay. So to go really, really fast and uh, to give you just uh, some major points. Could we move on directly to the first uh, graph, i.e. slide number three, <laughs> which is uh, probably the main thing one should bear in mind when you talk about trade in LDC countries. So you can see the decline, the secular decline of the share of LDCs in global trade, which stopped and reversed as of the 1990s and the year 2000. <laughs> and it can be interpreted in different ways. As we've heard, it's always very difficult to find the, the causal a link between the LDC status and what we see looking at the results, particularly at exports. What we have noted uh, recently is that the LDCs with abundant natural resources were able to benefit from the price variations of raw material to increase their share in global exports. But for countries who do not have uh, oil or other resources, uh, some Asian countries who were able to benefit from their geographical positions to better integrate the, uh, their country in the, the global chain. Well, this decline has stopped, but nevertheless, the share of LDCs in global exports uh, tends to stagnate around 1% of uh, glo uh, global exports. It stagnates with depending on the development of the price of raw materials. So this leads us to wonder whether the status, uh, the, the LDC status and this uh, differential uh, treatment, that special treatment, uh, which they benefit from allows to somehow explain this uh, development. Could we now move on to the next slide, the next graph? If we uh, look at them, uh, graph to try and explain 
what trade should uh, look like, uh, including the LDC status, we see that LDC export 30% less than other developing countries over the same period of time, but this lower performance tends to diminish with time, particularly in, in the United States and China, for, for, because for them structurally, uh, the LDCs do not export less than other developing countries. So there are two things that you can um, tease out of this graph, is that uh, certain agreements have been implemented during this period of time, as just, such as just everything but arms uh, for the European Union, or uh, another agreement in the United States, but did not, this did not necessarily accelerate this movement. This is what you can see on the pink uh, line in Europe. But we cannot uh, just talk about the role of the category because there are so many factors involved. And here, for instance, the fact that part of what is uh, defined and the vulnerability of LDC is just an exposure or overexposure, structural overexposure to trade or to the variations of trade generated by exogenous and external shocks. So underlying that, you have three points uh, which I would like to highlight, which may explain why <laughs> the share of LDCs in global trade is relatively lower than uh, other developing countries. So on the one hand, you have the erosion of uh, preferences, where the preferences uh, given to LDCs are not that uh, important once you take into account the free trade agreements which were uh, signed with other developing uh, countries. <coughs> so the, the advantage of LDCs tends to disappear with time or to even become negative. If we could move on to the next slide, please. I have a graph which shows that and the erosion of pr trade preferences in uh, European countries is visible, but for the United States, this preference becomes negative for the recent years because the advantages uh, granted to other developing countries are more important for certain uh, trade lines, which are very important for developing countries as compared to LDCs. So that's the first point. Second point, you also have the question of the rules of origin, which somehow somehow put a break on the commercial development of LDCs and their integration into the global value chains. And uh, we've seen very little change over the last uh, few years, even though some progress was noted. And this is what you can see in the next graph, which is just a small example of what this may entail. When the European Union modifies the rules of origin in the textiles uh, sector yeah, as of 2011, we clearly see on the graph that there is a clear uh, acceleration of uh, LDC's exports to Europe for such products. So to help uh, LDC's move on in the, their uh, commercial integration, you have these barriers which exist and uh, are not favorable to LDC's. And the third, my third point, to be very quick, non-tariff barriers play a major role, be they the sanitary, uh, sanitation standards or other types of standards for industrial products. They also tend to uh, not to be very favorable for uh, the LDCs. And in chapter six, um, my colleague and I, we mention a figure which is really significant. 
even if it is difficult to identify the amount and the impact of uh, trade non-tariff barriers, we consider that non-tariff barriers have reduced uh, their exports by $264 billion uh, over the period, the, the period 1993 until now, which represents about 30% of their exports. So these standards, uh, which are necessary, of course, uh, may tend to slow down the exports of less advanced countries, least advanced countries. The second point is that there are three uh, elements which reduce uh, the importance of LDCs in global trade, but this may ca be counterbalanced by other initiatives like Aid for Trade, AFT, which uh, uh, LDCs benefit from to improve their infrastructure, be it uh, material or non-material infrastructures. <laughs> you also have the agreement on uh, trade facilitation, WTO's trade facilitation agreement, which also aims at reducing uh, trade costs and improving uh, customs efficiency and all the technical assistance programs like the EIF, which allows uh, LDCs to benefit from a major support on these integration issues. And maybe I can conclude on that in the framework of what came with the COVID crisis, we were able to see that, with the, that, that LDCs, even before they had their first COVID cases, we had been strongly impacted by the reduction of uh, uh, trade in goods and services, and therefore they have to better diversify their exports and improve the quality of their exports. So the post-COVID world proposes to think about the direction uh, we have uh, to take uh, to accelerate the access of LDCs to global trade. I will stop now. I just tried to go very fast. I hope I was clear enough and not confused. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Laurent. So without further ado, I give the floor to the director of ODI programs, or replacing Jody King, who was not able to make it. You, you're you can make your comment, but you only have three to four minutes, not more than that. Thank you very much for being available. Because we have some speaker time. Dirk, would you agree, you and, and Matthias, to, to speak in the next panel if it's not a problem for you? Because I know that uh, uh, Secretary General Greenspan and uh, our colleagues from WTO and, and DESA have a very short time frame. So if Dirk and Matthias don't mind, I would integrate them into the next panel and let Secretary General Greenspan and our friend from uh, WTO to speak first, because we know that they have a very short time uh, uh, frame and uh, we are very lucky to have them with us, but we don't want to keep them waiting uh, too much. W would you mind Dirk and, and Matthias if we if we change a little bit and you become part of the last panel? Sure, I'm, I can postpone the cooking, no worries. <laughs> Matthias, no are problem. you okay with that? Yes, definitely, no problem. So, since you're the moderator of the final session, I give the floor with them. Thank you very much. We have had some technical challenges in connecting friends from Western Africa that has delayed a little bit the, uh, the déroulement of this meeting. And uh, I think that this speaks loudly about the importance of uh, improving connectivity, which is clearly one of the many challenges that, that we have been discussing today. So I, I would like to welcome and thank really uh, Rebecca, uh, Xian Cheng, um, Elliot, uh, the uh, Minister Sandra Lamba Johnson from Togo, Dirk and Matthias uh, for this concluding panel. And let me also acknowledge here the presence of Ambassador Manuel Escudero, who is the chair of the governing board of the Development Center. And uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to ask to all of you uh, um, a bit the same question that please feel free to, to address from your specific viewpoint uh, and institutional uh, belonging. And we, we have had today a long discussion about uh, reflecting upon the relevance of the LDC category 
50 years after the establishment of the category itself that let's recall uh, uh, was was um, the, the UN led process of course and uh, uh, in reflection also in view of the conference in Doha uh, the LDC5 conference and so this is a, a conference where we are looking back to look forward we have reflected about the structural challenges that many countries face and whether the inclusion of this category uh, has produced any meaningful uh, impact on the uh, on the development prospects of these countries. And we have different perspectives that have been shared by participants. We have seen that, for example, development assistance has somehow increased, but uh, commitments have not been uh, met yet. Trade preferences had a very important impact, but still many of these challenges remain um, unaddressed. And so one of the elements that was brought forward in the first panel was whether we need to reflect about the criteria that underpin the category, because the category is certainly useful for political advocacy and for guiding the action of the international community, but maybe some of the criteria that help shaping the category should be retalked. So without further ado, I would like to ask uh, in this order to Rebecca, Xian Chen, Minister uh, Johnson, Elliot, and then Dirk and Matthias, uh, what is your perspective on this important challenge as we approach to Doha? Rebecca, please, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you so much, Federico, and thank you for, for doing these changes in the last minute. I'm sorry for the colleagues that were waiting in the other panel, but really I, I was listening and, and it was really very interesting. And I think that there is, there is a lot of a, a common understanding of what has happened also in terms of the LDCs. You know, Federico, that the, the, the first time that uh, uh, we spoke about the special support to less developed was precisely when ANTAD was born <laughs> in 1964. So we born together. <laughs> and so we have been together since, since then, you know. Uh, and, and unfortunately, we have to say that many of the problems that uh, we saw at that moment to create the category of uh, the LDCs persist today, 50, 50 years later, yes? Uh, the formulation of internal support measures that is uh, for LDCs at the time that meant access to major markets, uh, 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 through the decades, uh, this has gradually expanded too. It's, we don't have what we have at the beginning. We expanded through major landmarks, uh, including the Singapore Ministerial Declaration in 1996, the Hong Kong Ministerial Declaration in 200, uh, 2005, and the services waiver of the WTO in 2011. So it's, you know, we, we have, done many things during during this time. But uh, despite it has been an important measure, the preferential treatment, the effectiveness of these schemes has uh, traditionally been hampered by the exclusion of products of particular export interest to LDCs, mostly agricultural products, uh, restrictive or unclear rules of origin. We saw the former, the former speaker talking about the rules of origin and when Europe changed the rules of origin, how they benefited from it and it continues to be a problem. And the inclusion of goods and services where LDCs have little supply and export capacity, yes. So in spite of these shortcomings, uh, preferential market access for goods has helped expand merchandise exports for LDCs. However, this has only been effective as a driver of development when it has been accompanied by the implementation of integrated development policies and strategies aiming at structural transformation. And I think that this is the main issue, yes? We need to put the, the, the support measures right. And there are problems in the support measures. But at the same time, is that that you put the measures and you leave the LDCs alone, yes? And we, we have heard also from Jorge, yes? How little they are receiving in financial resources, how little support they are receiving in climate change transformation, uh, the problems of debt, uh, the, 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 the company that they need for the graduation, etc. So uh, let me just 
again say that in our report of 2021, the least developed countries report, we have shown that only seven, seven LDCs have embarked in catch-up growth. Only seven of all the countries that are in this category have closed the gap with the rest of the developing and developed countries. So this has to tell, you, tell us something. And those countries are five of them in Asia. They are Bangladesh, Bhutan, Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar. And the other two uh, uh, are in, 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 the other, in the other continents. And so these countries have not only taken advantage of preferential market access conditions, but they have leveraged this support measures as part of a broader development strategy and policies. And that's why we talk so much about uh, the institutional capacities that we have to develop in both the public and the private sector. And you have to invest in institutional capacities. Uh, it doesn't come automatically because of the, of the measures. And also in terms of uh, uh, the, the themes of financing for development and technology that were also raised in, in the panels before. So despite uh, the international community having set uh, mechanisms that strengthen the capacity of LDCs to raise development finance, uh, the commitments taken have not been uh, met. You know, the commitment in 1981 by donors to dedicate 0.15 or 0.20 percent of GNP to LDCs has not been met. It, they, they, similarly, the commitments in multilateral climate policy on the LDC fund, we know that it's very small. So it's not really playing the role it has to play. And the aid for trade was mentioned, and I think that aid for trade is very important, uh, and it was a major achievement in terms of support for developing countries, but its impact on development of productive capacities of the, of the LDCs has been unfortunately not great. So it's a very important one, but we have to see how we make it work, because for the moment uh, it, it has a limited, limited impact. Similarly, in the, in the field of technology transfer for LDCs, there has been agreements and the community have agreed in, since the 1990 on trips and, and, and UNFCCC measures, uh, but they have remained largely ineffective in terms of boosting the transfer to technologies, green and other technologies to these countries. So, uh, you remember that a bank for LDCs, the, a technology bank for LDCs was established in 2018. Uh, this was a step forward in the right direction, but again, the limited funding of the institutions, uh, you know, meant, meant that the, the, the great ambition was not met by reality. So I think that in thinking ahead, we have been uh, really uh, pushing for new international support measures for LDCs. But we have first to learn from what we have done and has been ineffective. And part of it is that the, you know, empty commitments will not change reality. We need really, <laughs> if we will commit, if we will go forward, we cannot create expectations and later on, you know, just forget about it. And I think that for LDC5, this is, this is a major thing that we have really, we have to be serious in terms of meeting our, our uh, commitments. So let me just finish here uh, uh, saying this, the main messages. We need support to international in, institutional capacity building, including state capacity. <laughs> we need state capacity in the LDCs and we need capacities in the private sector. We need technology transfer. 
Uh, and we need to develop national technological capabilities in the LDC uh, economic agents. And we need synergies and coherence between the different international support measures, even if they originate in different spheres, you know, multilateral, regional, bilateral. We need policy coherence. And th this is a cry uh, that we hear from all the countries. And we need to evolve to the 21st century. <laughs> uh, we need the uh, climate change and digitalization to be part of our agenda. And what is it that we are going to do to help LDCs to meet uh, those requirements? And we have to monitor and we have to evaluate and we have to correct both the existing ISMs for the LDCs, but also the new ones that we, we, are go, we are prepared to push forward. So as the international community finalizes the Doha program of action of the LDCs for the next decade, it needs to show its commitments to these countries through the adoption of effective and bold initiative. Effective and bold initiatives. Otherwise, let me say with all the numbers that we have, that the promise of not leaving anyone behind will remain void. These countries are getting behind almost in every measure that we have at our, at our disposal. Thank you. Thank you, Federico. Oh, thank you to you, Rebecca, and uh, thank you for uh, the very strong messages that you shared with us and also for the continuous engagement that you have with us here at the Development Center and all the excellent uh, products and reviews that we do together. Uh, you mentioned one of the key elements for uh, um, going forward, the need of uh, helping developing countries being able of taking advantage of market access. And that was the original intention of Aid for Trade. And this can be the good transition to our next speaker, who is the Deputy Director General of the WTO, uh, Mr. Xiang Cheng uh, Zhang. So, um, uh, Mr. Zhang, what is, in your view, uh, the what have we learned from the past and how can we look uh, towards the future to do things better? Please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Federica. Uh, like uh, Rebecca, I listened to the previous uh, discussion with great interest, uh, and I think uh, is uh, very relevant and very useful, especially when uh, we are approaching to LDC5 uh, next month in Qatar, Doha. Uh, it's a good uh, uh, brainstorming for us. So I would like to uh, take this opportunity to share with you three points. Uh, the first point is about the past the yesterday of uh, uh, LDC from the uh, WTO's perspective. What has been achieved for LDCs? Uh, if we look back, oh, I think we have reasons to uh, remain positive. An uh, important step has been taken in support of LDCs as a multilateral training system has evolved over the past uh, decades. LDC has have been uh, accorded more favorable treatment than other uh, members in the WTO agreement. These flexibilities have been offered in different forms like a longer transitional period to implement the rules or exemption from uh, taking commitment in certain uh, disciplines. Uh, we have had uh, decisions on duty-free and quota-free market access for LDC products. We have guidelines in place for preferential rules of orange and the WTO members have ad advanced a step forward by creating conditions to enable exports from IODC services and the services uh, suppliers. This step has been the defining features of the system of the past decade. In addition, IODC have benefited from greater policy flexibility in implementing WTO rules. In June this year, WTO members agreed for the third time to allow more time to IODCs to implement the TRIPS agreement. The latest extension of the general transition period runs until July 2034. This represents an extraordinary flexibility. Special consideration has also been granted to LDCs in broad areas of WTO work. 
the trade facilitation agreement, which came into force in 2017, provided a novel approach to helping developing countries, especially helping the LDC to implement the agreement with the necessary support. We have also been supporting LDC with our Aid for Trade uh, initiative. LDCs remain the second largest recipient of Aid for Trade okay. Flows. That's fine. That's before my... The next global aid for trade review is scheduled for the next year. LDC needs and the priority will continue to be the spotlight of this initiative. And this is an area where we work closely with OECD. And we also host the enhanced integrated framework, uh, the program that supports trade capacity building in LDCs by strengthening trade institutions and the investing in productive sectors uh, with high export potential. The EAF partnership is working to ensure greater impact in LDCs. So a lot has been achieved so far. WTO members, both developed and developing, have come forward with a generous scheme. At the same time, global efforts may not have been enough to boost LDC trade to the desired level. So my second point is about uh, the current uh, LDC's uh, priorities. Uh, most of uh, you are aware that uh, due to the appearance of a new COVID variant, we had to postpone our ministerial conference, which was supposed to end the last week. But uh, what continues uh, with a sense of a purpose? We are close to having an agreement on fishery subsidies, which has provided maximum flexibilities to LDCs by mostly exempting them from the disciplines that are being developed. We are also seeking a multilateral response to the pandemic, which aims to facilitate access to vaccines, vital to protect lives in LDCs. Among the priorities identified by LDCs, cushioning the impacts from the graduation from LDC status has been the top agenda in recent years. This is also a topic central to the LDC-5 discussion. And uh, this is an area where WTO, in cooperation with uh, the EIF, has undertaken evidence-based analysis to help LDCs pursue their interests in an uh, in, in informed manner. The LDCs in the WTO seek to establish a smooth transition mechanism for LDC graduates, mainly to help th those countries continue to benefit from LDC preference over a certain period. And it is encouraging that the group has shown flexibilities and the continue the flexibilities in their engagements with members. Today, there is a broad recognition on the challenges arising from IODC graduation, and hopefully WTO members will soon be able to agree on an outcome which can boost the confidence of graduating IODCs as they prepare to integrate to the global economy with more competitive condition than before. My last point is about tomorrow, how international support measures uh, can be improved. Looking ahead, we need to redouble our effort to ensure that millions of people living in LDC have a chance for a brighter future. And I would like to make uh, three points. First, we need to keep improving on the implementation of the decision taken in the past to realize their full potential. The value of preference have been undermined due to inherent weakness in LDCs, as well as design of preference programs. We need to better investigate the underlying reasons of underperformance of LDC trade. Second, with one third of LDCs on the path of graduation, we need to support the graduating LDCs to sustain their development and momentum. A smooth and sustainable graduation should be an overriding objective of the international community so that those countries do not lose the hard-win gains. Third, 
it is vital that we foster dialogue to keep LDC abreast of different forces that are shaping global trading landscape. A strong involvement of IODC in many initiatives in WTO or otherwise can offer higher returns as they are untapped opportunities. That is why our occasion today is so important. By drawing forth with IODC's international organizations, research institutions, and academia, I firmly believe we can make a difference in LDCs as they explore new trade opportunities. And the upcoming LDC5 conference is an opportunity moment to reinforce this effort. During LDC5, partnering with several agencies, WTO will be co-hosting discussions on how to support LDCs on the path of graduation on 21st January and how to boost LDC participation in global trade on 26th January. I would like to invite you all to join our discussion in January in Doha. WTO will play its part and to support LDC in any way we can. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Director General. And uh, this is an excellent uh, transition that we're going to have. And uh, I, I ask the understanding of uh, Dirk and, and, um, and colleagues, because the Minister of Togo has been with us for quite some time. So I would like to give the floor now uh, to Her Excellency uh, Sandra uh, Ablamba Johnson. Uh, Madame la Ministre, uh, vous êtes toujours avec nous? Je vais voir. Madame Minister, vous êtes avec nous? Madam Minister, are you still with us? I can see that you've signed in, but I can't hear you. Hello, yes, we can hear you perfectly well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for staying with us throughout uh, this uh, conference. So you are the Minister for Togo in charge of uh, developing matters and you have been carrying out such considerable reform in your country and Togo is still one of the least developed countries but still has quite an ambitious agenda to try and transform the country and to become a strong growth country strong development country with solid basis as we know that the the economic model that they are is one which is strongly championed by your minister and you have great uh, assistance assistance from you UNCTAD and from the United Nations Network. So what does it mean for you to be a PMA and domestically speaking, what are you implementing currently and what are you doing to uh, to change the fate of Togo and to see Togo become in the very near future a much stronger growth country? Madam Minister, over to you. Thank you very much. I would just like to thank the organizers for having organized this high-level panel and this is such a relevant topic because I think it is so important that we need to think about the dynamics that we are currently on and it's a great it's a great opportunity to be on this panel as was mentioned Togo came to realize that at some point we have to take fate into our own hands and stand on our own two feet and so back in 2017 after a number of strategies that were implemented in our country over previous years, we had a whole range of growth strategies that we implemented. We realized that we need to think about policy differently. And we didn't want to just copy what others were doing, but we wanted to focus on what we could do. We wanted to believe in our own convictions and our own ideals. So we came up with a development plan in 2017. It based on structural reform within our economy, and it is built around inclusive growth, gr creating jobs, and also taking into account environmental aspects. As you all know, the, uh, the health crisis, the COVID crisis, had a great impact on our economies, which slowed things down, which is why in 2020, we came up with a new roadmap, a roadmap that highlights the social aspect of eco economic growth. 
because we want to build up our health infrastructure as well as building up more socioeconomic structures within our nation. That was adopted in 2020, right in the heart of the health crisis. And it's quite an ambitious plan that we have put in place. It's ambitious, but it's still quite achievable. And there are three fundamental parts of this, of this uh, policy. So first of all, building up social inclusion and peacemaking and peace building. So as, as you know, that uh, it is a major issue in a lot of our countries. The second point is about creating jobs and wealth within our nation by building on our own capabilities, our own potential. And third, administrative reform, because as you know, the administration, the government is what is going to help carry forward all of these policies that we're trying to implement. So with all of those three different sides working together, we have been working to push that policy forward and the new government set out a primary objective of being working on that reform. As you know, Togo has been working predominantly on uh, business reform as you, uh, and because we are starting to see the fruits of that reform because what we need, if we want to have growth within Togo, from Togo, we need to find local sources of business. And for that, we need to attract investors, be they local investors or foreign investors, to create businesses, local businesses in our country. And that's why we need private actors to join this stage as well. So, we, And that's why we need to attract financial partners. And once we have that, we can really build on and consolidate all that we have have been able to acquire thanks to all of the work with with UNCTAD and the like. So all of the reform that we have put in place and are still rolling out are going to help us quite effectively manage and it has helped us manage quite recently the health crisis. We were able to take it on quite easily and in just a few days we were able to set up quite an innovative digital tool like Movisi, which helped us respond to the crisis in a very practical way. Because there were so many people within our nation who were made even more vulnerable because of the crisis and we were able to reach out and help to them thanks to this app. We are able to put in state-backed financial mechanisms to help these people so that they could still have access to funding without having to actually move. So this is just one uh, one aspect of the positive change that we've seen because of all the reform that we have been putting in place in our country. But as was said a little earlier, we are working with institutional partners who are supporting us. And we had the IMF who helped us through the crisis with funding. The World Bank was also there with us. We have a number of bilateral partners, such as the United States and Germany, just to name a few. They have also provided considerable support, financial support to us. As you know, the only way for us is to be able to have as much autonomy as possible to be able to protect our own uh, people, our own citizens, and to ensure reform in a country. Thank you very much. Madam Minister, thank you very much. It was very clear. Uh, clear roadmap that you have there and we can see that you are really committed to seeing that roadmap come to fruition and as you know we're there we we work with togo on a number of areas and actually that is a perfect segue into our next session if it's not a short, given, given that we have changed panelists around a bit if we could just uh, quickly elliot could we just hear from uh, to Dirk, uh, who is uh, one of the most known experts in uh, the issue of productive capacity, trade and NDCs. And then we will uh, give the floor uh, to Mr. Bruckner for uh, his remarks and we'll conclude with the Chief Economist of DESA before giving the floor to our Chair, Mr. Escudero, for the concluding remarks. Thank you very much. Dirk, please. 
Uh, well, thank you very much indeed, and it's been really excellent to listen to all the, the presentations. And um, in my sort of short remarks in five minutes or so, I'll, uh, I'll sort of straddle the two, two uh, sessions, perhaps. So one is on trade preferences and, more, and the other is on the DPOA, the, the DOA program of action. Um, and um, I happen to have done some work for UNIDO to, on their position papers and uh, uh, for, for the LDC5. So uh, it won't be no, uh, any surprise that I will be uh, emphasizing industrialization um, quite a lot in combination with uh, trade preferences. Um, so my point about sort of the LDC and uh, category um, is that LDC preferences have been really important for LDCs. Um, but uh, as Rebecca Greenspan already mentioned, it's not enough. Um, it's not on its own, it's not enough. Um, uh, so it needs to be uh, accompanied with, with other measures, including uh, productive capability uh, building, which is exactly where the term aid for trade has come from, from, from the sort of the Doha, the, 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 the Singapore um, uh, Declaration and um, the sort of the, uh, the paragraph 57. And, um, and also, um, uh, it, the LDC preferences on their own haven't been enough to uh, combat marginalization of, uh, of LDC uh, trade. Um, and so just to sort of highlight some numbers, and I, so I compare two decades, so the decade, the past decade and with the decade before, that there have been declines in poverty in the first decade, so 2000-2010, but the declines in poverty in this decade after that have been less. Um, relative productivity from LDC to the rest of the world are now, is now 10%. But that's about what it was in 2010 as well. So the, the, the catching up in productivity was much faster in, from 2000 2010 than it has been 2010, 2020. Um, ma manufacturing share of LDCs in world and world GDP share has gone up. So the world the, the GDP share is about 1.3% in 2020, uh, but that compares to the population share of 13.6%. The LDC goods exports, um, I mean, some recent numbers are 2020, it was only 1.03% uh, of the world. And the SDGs envisage it to double from 1% to 2%. Um, uh, so it was 1% also in 2010. So that, it, there's a, a lot that still needs to be done. And the services export share is, is only 0.67%. Um, so it, there's, there's a lot more to do, to, to, to go. Now, why wasn't it so, uh, so why wasn't it enough? And I think the presentation by Laurent um, already highlighted some issues. Um, and so rules of origin need to be more liberal. Of course, you need to then sort of think a bit more about not only the gross exports of, of countries, but also the value addition of that exports um, in, in LDCs as well. Uh, when you uh, have more liberal rules of origin, you import more from, uh, from the, the bigger developing countries, such as China, into, uh, into African countries, for example. So you, you, you also get a lower share of value addition. But I still think that's really good to have more liberal rules of origin. Um, uh, anti bees, yes, um, and 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 also uh, standards. I think it's really important to uh, to highlight standards much more, also in the sort of the DPOA, and also that uh, developed countries and emerging markets should be actively importing. Uh, uh, have importing regimes. I, I sit on the Strategic Trade Advisory Group here in the UK of, uh, for trade, for, uh, for the Secretary of State. And there's quite a lot of attention to exports and inward foreign direct investment. I always say, how about outward investment and importing? And I think it's really important to have active import promotion policies that help countries to, to address um, the uh, standards uh, um, and, uh, and NTBs, address NTBs. And then you have the issue about preference erosion, and that, that was highlighted in the presentation. And I think that's also important. So that that I think uh, Patrick uh, would, would of course say about the uh, the LDC um, uh, category. Those are the ones that other countries are in need. Um, when countries think about their trade preferences, they always want to extend it to other countries as well. And so we sometimes ask, well, what is your objective? Which countries do you want to uh, what, uh, what do you want to to help? We'll find objective criteria to uh, to to reach you so so that it's WTO compliant. But I think the, the 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 issue is you may not reach only the country you need, and sort of a preference for everyone is a pre preference for no one. So I think the the, the issue and the, and the point to make for the LC conference is that the the right LDC index um, points to those countries that are most in uh, most in need. Then my final comment, I think, um, uh, uh, also bearing in mind time, is that. Um, um, that um, that I think the um, uh, that I agree with Rebecca Greenspan that bold uh, 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 and effective initiatives are important, and I think what is important here is that they also need to be targeted. So I think that that development doesn't come from uh, general investment climate; it comes from targeted interventions. And I've done um, sort of work in sort of 
well, I mean, um, uh, sort of Bangladesh um, a bit and uh, Ethiopia and Cambodia, for example, and how they have used LDC preferences. There is quite a lot of um, uh, other issues that come are important. The, the military regime in Bangladesh was permissive of the textile and clothing sector. In 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 uh, Ethiopia, there was an active uh, um, industrialization policy that was really important. There were always an, a range of other factors that were that were complementary, and so make sure that when you think about all these six action areas uh, in the DPOA, that there are targeted initiatives that follow on from that, and that the agencies, uh, all agencies also have LDC strategies, so not all agencies have LDC strategies, but they also have LDC strategies that target in each of these six areas um, that combine finance, um, uh, preferences, uh, LD preference, and capacity building and industrialization uh, initiatives. And so the final point, I think industrialization is absolutely key for, uh, for, for LDCs to, to get their trade share from not from 1 to 1.03, but to 2%. And industrialization is key, and we've got major challenges in the coming decade, which are about climate change. So green industrialization is absolutely important, and digitalization. So you need to combat the digital divide. It shan't, can't be business as usual because the digital divide will be growing. So you need to be actively encouraging uh, industrialization that takes into account uh, um, the, the, the climate change uh, uh, um, uh, constraints and opportunities, and also the digitalization constraints and opportunities. And I think if you have targeted initiatives in these areas, I think then um, then the 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 DPOA will be just as important as the IPOA, which I thought was really important because it helped the development community to move away from just MDGs to also SDGs, that productive capabilities are so important. Um, and so if the DPOA can also bring this, this, this shift in the development community that, that addressing climate change and digitalization uh, helps, then I think it's going to be really important for, for, uh, for LDCs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dirk. And you, you offer on me on a silver platter the transition to Matthias Bruckner, uh, who is a senior economist in the Committee on Development Policies, because the Committee on Development Policies has actually put productive capacities and productive transformation as one of the connecting threads of the, of the agenda uh, that should come out from Doha. So, Matthias, please, uh, what is your view on past, future, past, present and future before then we move to the close with the Chief Economist and uh, Ambassador Scudero? Matthias, please. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, yes, you highlighted already the, the key message from the Committee for Development Policy on the work, and that is related to productive uh, capacity, um, and that has already been rightly stressed with us by by Evelyn before and by uh, by Ms. Greenspan from Antad. Um, but just me focus this comment as first discussed uh, on the trade part, on the, the work of CDP, on the question on trade, um, because yes, as already said, this has been a key focus of the LDC since the establishment. That was one of the key um, reasons to establish the category to, to help them integrate better into the global economy. And yes, progress has been very limited. Um, and we've just seen the, the SDG, you have just heard the SDG target on doubling the share of uh, LDCs and world exports by 2020 that was shined in the um, agenda 2030 has unfortunately been missed. So there's certainly more to be done. Of course, we have also seen one main reason has been particularly in the past that in the first decades, there had been actually very little support um, on trade area. I would say that nevertheless from the work from CDP clearly emerged and that has been raised already in the discussions before that LDC status can and have played a very critical role in better integrating LDCs in the global economy. So this is probably one of the bright spots of, uh, of the establishing the LDC category and there are really three strands um, of arguments for such a positive view. One of course is empirical and also the, the late chair of the uh, LDC subgroup, Professor Stefan Klaasen, along as many others, have worked on this topic and also found that once you compare LDCs with those countries that were similar in some extent to LDCs, so that also had some structural handicaps, so probably not to the same extent, then you see that LDC status seem to have benefited, have boosted exports, of course, not sufficiently, and maybe not compared to, to more advanced developing countries and to developed countries. And the second main reason already highlighted is the utilization of support. Um, in the latest LDC handbook, we, we, we recall um, 
figures provided by WTO. So we have in 2019, there were $45 billion worth of exports that were uh, imported by countries under LDC specific duty-free quota free schemes. So market access clearly is used. Um, so this is something important also in particular if we um, compare this to the LDC specific support on development cooperation, there's certainly far more to be done. And then the third argument is clearly the impact of this support in particular market access on graduation. And we have heard that already um, this morning by the intervention particular from Bangladesh, but also from um, Professor Ocampo. Um, and you see the CDP when recommending countries for graduation and also when monitoring countries during their graduation process um, goes far beyond the LDC criteria and has established a, a robust and, and um, comprehensive framework for that. And part of that are these detailed studies. DESA provides, UNCTAD provides, the countries themselves provides, WTO provides, and all this really showed that duty-free, quota-free access has been very instrumental for graduation and for overall development progress, particularly in countries like Bangladesh, Cambodia, Myanmar, but also to some ex to a lesser extent in countries like Laos, PDR, Nepal, Solomon Island, or the Maldives. So it has worked. Of course, there are clear qualifications because that's already was the last point. It worked, it was very effective for some, but not for all. There's great heterogeneity. Um, so many LDCs that are not in the process of graduation now are exactly those that have not been able to utilize um, trade preference schemes. Um, and the CDP has looked into that issue actually for several years and identified limited productive capacity as the main reason for this insufficient uptake. And that's very much in line with the analysis and very complementary in the analysis done by UNCTAD on the same topic. And that also had been raised, raised before. This is the area, the demand side through development um, to market access has been positive, but there needs to focus on supply side Aid for trade was raised. Aid for trade is very important. Um, the support given there is positive, is valuable, but it's not at the scale that it's needed. And it's also um, probably not, maybe not integrated enough with overall uh, progress, overall progress to structural transformation that maybe brings me straight to the to the way forward from LDC from the CDP work on this. So first of all, as already highlighted strongly by uh, WTO, um, as market access has been so important, um, it's important to make sure that if once that support is withdrawn, um, there's no, there are no setbacks. So that requires uh, smooth transition provisions and dedicated graduation support. There's definitely scope and that had been highlighted nicely to improve the existing schemes. And then overall, really, there's a focus to uh, orient the overall support um, towards expanding productive capacity for sustainable development to support the much needed structural transformation. And of course, also to um, uh, enable all countries to benefit to ensure that really no country is left behind. Um, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you, Matt, also for sticking to the time and thanks to the CDP also for including in its recommendation as part of the, make of the instruments, the tools to support smooth graduation, our production transformation policy reviews that my colleague Annalisa Primi, who is connected here, is leading together with the EEF, ANCTAD, UNIDO, and many others. Let me now move to our last but certainly not least uh, speaker who is the chief economist of UNDESA, uh, Elliot Carlton uh, Smith, uh, Harris, sorry. Elliot, uh, in your view, having listened to what um, other colleagues have said, uh, what will be uh, the most important issue to, to put forward in Doha? And what is, what is your assessment of what has worked and what has not worked so far? Please. Thank you, Federico. Um, let, let me start by just looking a little bit at that question of the extent to which being a part of the LDC category has managed to reduce the structural handicaps of least developed countries. That's a fundamentally different, a difficult question because it's difficult to establish an account of factual. How well would the LDCs have developed over the last 50 years in the absence of an LDC category with all of the established preferences? Now, and we have to bear in mind here that development would not be only due to LDC preferences, but also to domestic policies, to the international policy environment as well and as well to other forms of support that countries do receive that are not dependent 
on LDC status. So all of that is still a big question mark as to what exactly is attributable to the LDC membership itself. On average, however, we do see that the LDCs have made progress towards structural handicaps or reducing the structural handicaps. The CDB uses the Human Assets Index, the HAI, as well as the Economic and Environmental Vulnerability Index, the EVI. Now, we see significant progress towards the HAI, the Human Assets Index, with many of the LDCs doing quite some catching up. Of course, there are uh, varying experiences, heterogeneity as, um, heterogeneity as, uh, as Matthias used that word, in the different rates of progress, but there's been relatively limited progress in reducing vulnerabilities as measured by the Economic and Environmental Vulnerability Index. And once again, there's a lot of heterogeneity. Uh, some LDCs were increasingly vulnerable even before COVID struck. And so on balance, it's hard to, to, to draw a, a definitive conclusion on the role of the LDC specific uh, support measures in reducing the structural handicaps uh, over the last uh, decades. Now, the last, the most recent decade, the decade uh, from 2011 to 2021, has been remarkably successful. We've seen uh, 20 LDCs now meeting the LDC criteria for graduation, 20 of them reaching that stage between 2011 and 2021, compared to only seven in the previous decade between 2000 and 2001. And as, as has been noted by several speakers, the graduating countries are the ones who've been the main beneficiaries of LDC support. They've also been the ones who've been best able to utilize this support. And I won't go into that because I think Matthias has handled that uh, pretty well, but it does raise the question of if, if only some of the countries have been able to take advantage of these LDC sp um, specific support measures, particularly in the area of trade, is there something about them that makes it difficult for them to take advantage to the same extent that perhaps uh, some of the graduation countries have done? And in that case, one might ask legitimately the question, do they have the appropriate capacity to be able to take advantage of these of these um preferences. So for example, are they able to produce the goods that could be sold under the duty-free and quota fee provisions uh, of the trade preferences? Hmm? That's just a particular question. Uh, and it is a question that the whole community has been asking itself because we are all focused on this question of enhancing productive capacity. I'm going to come back to that in a moment because the question is productive capacity for what? Now, I think one of the things that we have to, to start looking at is how the international support measures themselves can be improved based on the experience of the last 50 years. Well, clearly, uh, many commitments have been made that are promising LDC specific support. Those commitments need to be fulfilled. ODA is at the top of that list. And no one on this call or in the conference or who, who works in, in development would dispute the fact that, you know, this is a really important issue. Um, we, know, we do need to uh, simplify the access for um, access to existing funds for the LDCs. We do need to provide debt relief where necessary. We do need to simplify the approaches to um, accessing and taking advantage of these support measures. Uh, there is clearly a need for complementary support so that the LDCs that are not yet at the stage of graduation can benefit from the preferential market access. And of course, uh, we've all spoken uh, during this call uh, as well about enhancing productive capacity, increasing aid for trade. Matthias spoke as well about the importance of not withdrawing support prematurely because that would lead to disruptions that might hinder graduation. And of course, the question of organizing support around the overarching framework of enhancing productive capacity for sustainable development. And that would be including, as as Dirk mentioned, the idea of taking full advantage and being prepared as well for the challenges of digitalization and, um, and climate change. But I'm going to come back to the, to the question I posed earlier, which is if the uptake of the LDC specific support measures is so mixed, then maybe we should consider that the problem is not that the support is inadequate. Although, as I say, we have to admit that in the question of ODA, we have fallen short of our promises. But perhaps we need to be considering a different kind of support. Now, in his very excellent presentation, Dirk talked about the share of goods exports of the LDCs and their share in manufacturing. And those are, in essence, the metrics of our success for LDC development. We see them as graduating as being successful if they are able to increase those shares. But what are we talking about? Manufacturing of goods for export. That's, what, that's the measure that we're using. And that then means that we are designing our aid for trade 
with that in mind. That's the productive capacity that we have in the back of our minds when we think about LDCs and their requirements. Their capacity to produce manufactured goods and manufactured goods that can be exported competitively. Now, I get the impression that the philosophy of the LDC specific support is that there are structural weaknesses that prevent them from doing that, from manufacturing goods competitively for export and sale abroad, and that these weaknesses have to be compensated for by the support measures. You know, we have preferential market access to compensate for a fundamental lack of competitiveness in production, ODA to compensate for weak revenue bases and thin financial markets. Presumably, during the period of the support, these structural weaknesses will be overcome they can graduate, the measures are then gradually no longer needed. And yet we all agree that the measures need to be preserved even after graduation. Well, for me, that means that we don't fundamentally, we really don't believe that the structural weaknesses will actually be overcome in this period. And perhaps the reason for that is we're trying to compensate for the weaknesses rather than change them. So why don't we provide support measures designed to overcome the weaknesses? Does that mean that we fundamentally think that these weaknesses cannot be overcome? Let me give you a thought experiment. I come from two, well, I have uh, citizenships of two small island developing states. Now, we've always known that small size, small population will prevent these countries from ever attaining economies of scale in manufacturing production. My domestic markets are so small, I can only prosper through trade. And that's why we focus on preferential trade uh, market access. The small, uh, small size, however, means that fundamentally, without these preferences, I will always be uh, uncompetitive in, in, in manufacturing. But shouldn't I instead be looking for my development in an area where my small size, which cannot be changed, is not the binding constraint? And when I start to build a productive capacity, should that be the productive capacity to, to produce manufactured goods? Or should I be looking to build up the capacity to provide value-added services? Services which I might add I would now be much more capable of exporting through digital means. So perhaps I can also turn that perceived weakness of my small population, which is a real handicap in terms of consumer markets, into a potential strength. If it's a really small number of people I'm responsible for, I can educate them all to world standard, can't I? And then they would be better placed to produce these kinds of services competitively. And so out of the small size, I make a bit of a, of a strength rather than focus on the weaknesses and the obstacles that that poses to my development. It means I'm not thinking of my development in terms of producing goods for export, manufactured goods, because that is just the way the presently industrialized countries got there. But that's not the only path to development. And that I think is part of the issue that we need to be considering in Doha in January. That means, however, that the type of support measures we would consider as being suitable, the type of productive capacity that the countries need to develop, the type of trade that they aspire to and the type of aid for trade that would make sense, that all has to be reconsidered. Let us be honest and think about what we mean when we talk about building up capa productive capacity, what we mean by aid for trade. And let us ask ourselves, are we providing what these countries actually need in the current context with the global trading system the way it is? Or are, are we providing what we have always thought they should get simply because that's what we saw succeed in past decades. What right. we need, in other words, and I'm finishing here, is a menu of support services from which an LDC can choose those support measures that would help it to reduce or overcome its own particular structural weaknesses. One of my countries has a per capita income of close to 30,000. The other one is just above that not because they started producing manufacturing goods, no, but because on the one hand, they've moved into financial services, and on the other hand, they have been able to move upstream in oil production, into chemicals and the like. All of that came from the fact that they focused on developing their human capacities first and foremost. And that is why I'm gonna end with this. I think that sustainable graduation support facility that we intend to propose and present at the Doha conference is so critically important and holds such promise. The path to graduation and sustainable development is going to be individual and unique to every country. Our support needs to be equally tailored and targeted. This facility gives us an opportunity to do that. Our mindsets have to also become more flexible. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Elliot, because you put on the table very interesting 
and provocative talks. And you also spoke to the need of uh, heterogeneity. I mean, uh, the cases that you put forward are clearly very relevant. Uh, we have heard from, from other representatives and countries the, the different needs that they may have. And I think that this is a very important conversation that we are having. I will not try to summarize uh, because it has been very rich and also because we're running late and I don't want to keep you waiting. So let me immediately give the floor to uh, Ambassador Manuel Escudero. And uh, after he will uh, conclude, I will ask my uh, friends uh, from France, uh, from uh, Ferdi, from uh, um, uh, OHRLS to also join me in saying one final word uh, as co-organizers of this event. So uh, Ambassador Escudero, the floor is yours, please. Oh, thank you very much, Federico. I'm really, you know, it's fascinating to listen. I think that uh, Elio Canton uh, Harris, uh, instead of closing, you know, <laughs> this, uh, this uh, gathering really has opened, you know, new horizons. Hopefully they will be discussed in the future uh, in Doha. I would like to thank uh, Ferdi and the United Nations Office of the High Representative for Least Developed Countries, Landlocked the Developing Countries and Small Island Developing States, and also the French Ministry of Europe and Foreign Affairs for this very timely event. This is a crucial moment for everyone as we face multiple and interconnected challenges. But uh, this moment is especially difficult for least developed countries with fragile context and difficulties for maintaining the required policies for recovery in place. With the emergence of new variants, the pandemic is taking longer than expected and the longer this pand the pandemic goes, gaps that are have, have been ex exacerbated already will be widened even, even more. Two of the most pressing challenges for these countries are, of course, related to first, access to vaccines and B, to the sustainability. These two topics were widely discussed on Monday during the high level meeting of the Development Center where 55 countries at different levels of development from LDCs to advanced economies agreed to call for a more inclusive and sustainable recovery based on the need to scale up solidarity of the international support. Into this context, having a strong international support system targeted towards the most in need is fundamental. In fact, developing countries are a very diverse group of countries with different challenges and opportunities. And this is why having a separate category for these developed countries, which has been recognized here today is of great importance. I would like, however, to emphasize that after these uh, 50 years of LDC category, we need, as it was said now, to rethink support mechanisms to LDCs, including the access to finance, the sustainability, and of course, the recognition of a vulnerability index that helps better assessing LDC's challenges. And what is more important, we need to complement these support mechanisms with a focus on actions on the long term. LDCs need a stronger support to building their national strategies for a production transformation of their economies that helps the advance in the economic diversification that they need. To this end, I would like to place the OECD Development Center membership and a space for dialogue at the service of a continued dialogue as we prepare for DOA. First, we need to advance discussions on how to better establish targeted national approaches that take into account the specific vulnerabilities of the LDCs with a specific focus on strengthening their productive capacities. And second, we have energetically called for rethinking international approaches based on solidarity and reciprocity by stressing the need of building new partnerships that would combine finance, that is working on the sustainability and knowledge exchange. That would allow for LDCs to give a strong step towards graduation. So the Devo Development Center has a long-standing history in supporting the LDC's agenda, in particular with the follow-up of the Istanbul process and the LDC4 monitor that we implemented with many of our partner institutions present here today. And we, of course, are strongly committed to repeat this experience 
in an LDC-5 monitor, as we believe it is a powerful tool to contribute to the LDC's agenda looking forward. So let me finish, my dear colleagues and friends, by wishing to meet you all in Doha in January to continue the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador Scudero, for your uh, concluding words. Let me now give the floor to our uh, partner in crime, uh, co-organizers. Um, um, I would like to uh, give the floor. I see that Patrick is suggesting me uh, that I start, but I spoke too much, Patrick. So I will suggest that you start, Patrick, and then we have um, Monsieur Lacoste, uh, Susanna, and uh, I will say just goodbye at the end because I've already said too much. So Patrick, uh, je t'en prie. Federico, thank you very much. Federico, thank you very much. And thank you much to everyone for having joined us. Sorry, I have the English interpretation coming through here. A bit of a problem there. So it seems that we had a lot of technical issues through the seminar. That's just another one to add to the basket. So thank you all for those who joined us today. Thanks to all of those of you who were part of today's debate and who spoke. It was a fantastic discussion, a highly fruitful conversation that we had. And it was fantastic to see people from diplomacy, from international organizations, from research institutions and the like. Now, it's uh, far too late to quickly do a summary of today's session because I think we've covered so many topics today. And I think that Elliot Harris provided a fantastic summary of today's session. The issue of criteria, the issue of capacity, production capacity. He really summed up the topic quite fantastically. He drew parallels between the three sessions that we had, three in-depth sessions that we had. And it was a fantastic opportunity to say that we can't just say we need to build capacities, we're going to change things structurally. We need to say why. And in answering that question of why, building up capacity is a fundamental part, but it's, it really brings us back to the rationale behind the list of the categories and behind the criteria. And quite naturally, it's not just about uh, patting people on the back for good policy. It's not saying that everyone can change or it's not trying to, uh, to get rid of all forms of vulnerabilities because some vulnerabilities cannot be uh, completely done with. Some of them, we will just have to find ways of reducing them. And these were just a few topics amongst me that were tackled today. So thank you all for your participation. Thank you for the lively, lively discussions. And I would like to thank our co-organizers as well for today's session. And I'm sure that we have all learned a great deal. Thank you once again to the OHR LLS and and the high representative and the secretary thank you very much and i would also like to thank uh, representatives from france so i'd like to thank both courtney and philippe and i don't know if the director is still with us but i'd like to thank her as well Thank you very much. Well, as we know, France will take up the presidency of the European Union. I'm not. I wonder if LDCs will be one of the priority areas. But obviously, if you would, if Philippe, if you have any final words you would like to mention. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Now, obviously, we are fully aware of the fact that we'll be taking over presidency of the European Union for the first half of next year, in quite an interesting climate, uh, with uh, an interesting political agenda to tackle. Now. I was able to attend a great deal of this afternoon sessions and I found it quite interesting and I was struck really by the depth and the vision that we saw this afternoon. 
it, it was a great opportunity to see just how relevant this category, the LC, LDC category is, and to extend that into the criteria as well. I think it's interesting to see the debate around the changes that may need to come into effect there. It was quite interesting. And what, what I take home from that is just how relevant this category still is. And that has actually served its purpose for a number of years now. Now, I'm no economist or uh, I'm no legal specialist. I'm someone who is quite a practitioner at heart, but I found it quite interesting to see the different uh, points that were raised on the practical side of this. So really, what do countries get out of uh, being on the LDC list? It's some form of positive discrimination. It's uh, being proactive in a way. And just on that, I would like to highlight the work that Ferdi has been doing and the Center for Policy in Bangladesh, the work in, in, um, in, in Senegal, in the, the work done by the Commonwealth organizations, and also the OECD, and also the LDC for Monitor initiative, it's quite a fantastic initiative. And thanks to that, we have been able to carry out part, in part assessments of a number of, a number of key factors. It's obviously an independent monitoring committee of the up, upcoming Do, Doha action plan, which, and it will be finalizing that in the coming weeks in the lead up to the next Doha meeting. And obviously, uh, France will provide considerable support to that because it is all part of a greater effort to be more transparent, also to uh, to be more accountable for our own policies. Because overall, it is about a matter of consistency, having consistent policy in terms of uh, industrial policy, development policy, and I think it's all about being far more efficient and effective when it comes to international solidarity. Really, I would like to thank all those who took part in this afternoon session and the organizers, because obviously this isn't the first time there's been such an event, but it's always, as always, a very interesting event. So thank you very much. Philippe, thank you very much. and. All the best for the upcoming presidency of the European Union, given the current circumstances. And final comments, Suzanne, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? And I would like to join uh, everybody for thanking all the presenters and participants. This was truly inspiring. And we very much will work on taking this forward and taking this to Doha. The technical glitches were mentioned. We are committed to make Doha an in-person meeting where we can have real coffee breaks and real dinners and do networking and discuss how to implement the new Doha program of action, which hopefully will be agreed uh, by end of next week in New York. Uh, we, we, we try to be optimistic. It's, uh, we need the support of all the member states who are listening to uh, make this happen. But um, so uh, I just wanted maybe for those who weren't there in the beginning, as, as uh, USG Rattray said, we are working with the WHO, we are working with the health minister of Qatar, we're working with everybody on testing, mask wearing, air filtration, social distancing, and whatever you can imagine to make this a safe in-person gathering. It will have, I mean, this meeting was great. As was said, we learned a lot and uh, we got a lot of inspiration, but I think personal contact would also, uh, be a very important uh, part of that. And of course, as I said, the, the conference is about how to get all these suggestions that were made today implemented in practice on the ground for the 1.1 million people, a billion people living in the LDCs. Thank you so much.
Well, thank you. I will not add anything else. Just a word of thank to all those who just want to say a word of thank to all the interpreters and to all of you and uh, see you in Doha then. Goodbye.